Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! We begin with new clause three, with which it will be convenient to consider the new clauses and amendments as listed on the selection paper. Mr. Matthew Pennycook to move new clause three. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I beg to move new clause three in my name and in the name of my honourable friends. New clause three concerns the issue of parliamentary oversight of the negotiations that will follow the triggering of Article 50. It would require the Government to report back to Parliament at least every two months on the progress of negotiations and to lay reports before both Houses of Parliament on each occasion. Let me be clear, its purpose is to improve the Bill by providing Parliament with the means not only to effectively monitor the Government's progress throughout those negotiations, but to actively contribute to their success by facilitating substantive scrutiny that can positively influence the outcome. Ms. Madam Deputy Speaker, we are only here debating this and other new clauses and amendments to this bill today because the Supreme Court upheld the High Court's November ruling on the triggering of Article 50, confirming that only Parliament, not ministers using the royal prerogative, can initiate the start of the UK's exit from the EU. I won't give way, I'll just make a little progress if that's okay. The Supreme Court was right to make clear that Parliament should exert democratic influence over Brexit. That influence should be felt at the start, throughout, and most importantly, at the end of the formal process of leaving the EU. In practice, we on this side of the House believe that must mean three distinct pillars of parliamentary scrutiny and accountability. First, provision of a detailed plan published prior to the start of negotiations that can inform future debates and votes and that can be used throughout as a point of reference. Second, a means of ensuring robust parliamentary oversight throughout the formal negotiation period. Third, a meaningful debate and vote in Parliament on the proposed deal before it is signed off with the European Council and Parliament. Happy to give way. Thankful to the uh, honourable gentleman for giving way. Does he really think that in a negotiation which can take many, many months and be extraordinarily complicated, is it in the best interests of the United Kingdom to have to reveal their hand every two months? Be very clear, we are not asking the government to renew, reveal the minutiae of the negotiations or to micromanage the process, and I'll come on to that further on in my remarks. Under pressure, the government conceded the first of those requests in the form of the white paper published on Thursday. My honourable friend, the member for Holborn St Pancras, will seek to win agreement for the third tomorrow when he moves new clause one. The purpose of new clause three is to secure the second of those pillars and in so doing ensure an enhanced role for honourable members throughout the process. The government should welcome an enhanced role for parliament throughout the negotiations for two reasons. First, while ministers obviously need sufficient room for manoeuvre and understandably cannot therefore consent to the micromanagement of the process by parliamentarians, I'm going to make some progress if I can. Active and robust parliamentary scrutiny will aid the negotiations by testing and strengthening the government's evolving negotiating position and their hand with the European Union. Second, facilitating substantive parliamentary scrutiny and accountability would in itself help bind the wounds of the referendum and forge a genuine consensus in the months and years ahead by reassuring the public, particularly the 16.1 million people who voted Remain, that they will not be marginalised or ignored, but that their views will be taken into account and their interests championed by their representatives in Parliament. Happy to briefly give way. Thank the member for giving way. Could he explain if, on regular intervals such as he has described, this House is to trail over the detailed negotiating position of the government to express its view on it? which will be known then to those we were negotiating with, how that will not undermine the position of the government when it comes to negotiations. If the Honourable Member would allow me to make some progress, he will realise that that's not what we're asking for. And when it comes to sensitive, confidential matters, we hope there are mechanisms to allow the House 
to be able to view and respond to those. I'm going to make a little bit of progress if I can. In departing the EU, we need a deal and a process that works not just for the 52% that voted leave, or for the 48% who voted remain, but for each and everyone who has a stake in our country's future. Yeah. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, no one can reasonably accuse the Secretary of State of being unwilling to appear before the House. He has responded to every question put to him on this subject, even if, to ape the language of the White Paper, it didn't always feel as if we got an answer. But what is required throughout the formal negotiations is something more an opportunity for honourable members to play an active role in scrutinising and influencing the process, rather than merely observing and commenting upon it retrospectively. As my honourable friend, the member for Wolverhampton North East, rightly argued at second reading, honourable members are not passive bystanders. We should be active participants in this process. I thank my honourable friend for giving way. Will my honourable friend agree with me that it is important that Parliament is sovereign throughout this whole process and gets a chance to have a look at the general direction to which the government is proceeding with the withdrawal from the EU? My honourable friend makes a very good point. As she'll see, what we're asking for is no more and no less than the European Parliament will see, and I'll come on to that in my speech. Substantive parliamentary scrutiny and accountability is not the same as accountability after the event and New Cause 3 is focused on securing what is needed for the former. The Secretary of State has made clear on numerous occasions that when it comes to the provision of information during the negotiations, it is his intention that honourable members will enjoy the same access to information as their counterparts in the European Parliament, but not only than that, that, the situation here will be an improvement upon what the European Parliament sees. Now, we do not know precisely what the members of the European Parliament will see throughout the negotiations. But it is reasonable to assume that their involvement is likely to be conducted in accordance with the provisions of Article 218 of the Treaty of the Functioning on the European Union, and that the detailed arrangements are likely to be similar to those set out in the 2010 Framework Agreement on relations between the European Parliament and the Commission. And it's worth stating for the record, Madam Deputy Speaker, what those involve. Paragraph 23 of the Framework Agreement makes clear that the European Parliament shall be, and I quote, immediately and fully informed at all stages of the negotiation and conclusion of international agreements. In addition, paragraph 24 requires that information shall be provided to the European Parliament, and again I quote, in sufficient time for it to be able to express its point of view if appropriate, and for the Commission to be able to take into account Parliament's views as far as possible. Lastly, in order to facilitate oversight of any sensitive material, Article 24 of the Framework Agreement states that Parliament and the Commission undertake to establish appropriate procedures and safeguards for the forwarding of confidential information from the Commission to Parliament. In short, the Commission lets the European Parliament know in good time what is proposing, with provisions for sensitive or confidential material, and provide sufficient time for the Parliament to provide feedback and act upon if appropriate. That is now the baseline of European parliamentary scrutiny, the baseline that the Secretary of State has assured us that this House can not only expect to match, but to surpass. Now, I'd happy to give way. Giving way. I think you'll find that most European papers are published in English by the House of Commons Library, but he hasn't yet answered the question about where he would draw his line in the sand in relation to what he refers to as micromanagement and material that should be discussed every two months. I've been absolutely clear, I'm afraid, and, and, and it is up for the government to determine what sensitive material would come before members of parliament. And that process, and that, I'll just make a, a little bit of progress if I can. That is the baseline of European parliamentary scrutiny. And acknowledging the delicate balance between the need for robust parliamentary oversight and the needs of the executive, it is that baseline of oversight that new Clause 3 seeks to secure for this place. As the Right Honourable and Learned Member for Beaconsfield argued at second reading, process matters. And for the reasons I've outlined, the Government happy to give away. Friend for, for, for giving way. Uh, I respect the democratic result of the referendum, but we all owe it to our constituents to get the best deal for them. And as the East Midlands exports 50% of its goods to the European Union, I would be failing in my duty as an East Midlands MP if I didn't have the chance to ensure that those jobs are not jeopardised by the government deal. Isn't that why scrutiny is important? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah.
That is precisely why scrutiny is important, and I think if the Government were approaching this in a reasonable and sensible manner, they would welcome the Honourable Lady's input into the process in an active manner. The Government should embrace, as I, as I was saying before, rather than resist agreeing to a proper process for actively engaging the House in the considerable challenge it now faces. The undertakings sought in new clause 3 would ensure the active and constructive involvement in Parliament in that process and increase the chances of securing the best possible deal for the British people. I hope the Government will consider new clause 3 in the spirit in which it is moved and I look forward to hearing the Minister's thoughts on the matter. Madam Deputy Speaker, I would like to now turn to the important matter of the rights of European Union nationals living in the UK and in so doing speak to new clause 8 but principally new clause 6 in my name and the name of my honourable friends. As my honourable friend the member for Hampstead and Kilburn argued so passionately during last week's second reading debate, EU nationals that have put down roots in the UK are part of the fabric of our nations and our communities. They are our neighbours, many sustain the public services we rely on and they deserve to be treated with respect. They should not be used as bargaining chips in the negotiations. I have no doubt that many honourable members on both sides of the House have had, as I have, EU nationals attending their constituency advice surgeries to express the sense of trauma and anxiety that they have felt every single day since the 23rd of June last year, and to seek reassurance. But while the individual honourable members can, and I am sure have, sought to reassure, we can provide EU nationals living in our constituents with no guarantees. Only the Government has it within its gift to do so. The purpose of New Clause 6 is therefore a simple one. It would ensure that on the day Section 1 of the Act comes into force, the rights of residents of EU nationals living in the UK or opportunities for those nationals to obtain such rights of residence will be guaranteed on the date at which Article 50 notice is formally served. I am most grateful to Honourable Friend. Uh, even the Prime Minister's statement today did not provide certainty. And what constituents say to us, those who have lived here for a number of years, is they need certainty to know how they can plan their lives. Does he agree with me that, in any event, someone who has lived here for five years can get permanent settlement, and someone who has lived here six years lawfully can also be eligible for British, British citizenship. So it is vital that the government states this very clearly. I, I agree 100% with my right honourable friend. I'm, I'm exceptionally grateful. Could I urge him to look at a report, uh, a commission organised by British Future, which uh, I chaired? And essentially, what we managed to do is have cross party support across this chamber, which would say, on triggering Article 50, that is the point when rights come in, but then have a transition period of about five years, which allows people to normalise their status and have a special status to allow for our relationship with Ireland. And that would be a way forward to give certainty to any EU citizens, but also be perceived as fair across the whole of the EU. I think that apes part of the suggestion we've made and it's picked up in other new clauses, such as new clause 57, which touch on the subject. I will make a little progress if I can now. Honourable members will know that permanent residence is an EU law concept similar to, but not exactly the same as indefinite leave to remain in the UK for non-EU citizens. As such, it is not guaranteed that the concept itself will continue to exist after we leave the EU. But we are not debating today the complex legal issues that arise in this area. Instead, we are debating a principle, how the rights associated with permanent residence are to be guaranteed. I'm happy to give way, and then I am going to make a little bit of progress. We're not debating the detail, but I'm afraid that is what he's proposing. He's proposing a rather wide blanket measure which gives an unconditional right for many people to stay in the country. But a specific question to him what provision is he making in his new clause, because I can't see any, for the almost uh, uh, the over 4,000 EU nationals who are in United Kingdom prisons, and what the arrangements will be when we leave the European Union to make sure we can remove them from the United Kingdom, which we can currently do under the Prisoner Framework Transfer Agreement? On the specific point, he will know it depends what the terms of the sentence for. The, this new clause six is focused at an in principle guarantee, guarantee from the government to uh, secure the rights of EU nationals. Madam Deputy Speaker, few would question the fact that Brexit has divided the country. But on this issue, there is a clear consensus. 
that the government should act decisively to provide certainty to EU nationals. A motion tabled by my right honourable friend, the member for Lee, in July last year, which called on the government to commit with urgency to giving EU nationals currently living in the UK the right to remain, passed the House overwhelmingly. That parliamentary support is mirrored among the public. Polling by British Future shows that 84 per cent of people, including 77 per cent of Leave voters, support existing EU nationals being able to stay in the UK. The Labour Party has called repeatedly for the government to act to end the uncertainty these individuals face. Indeed, such is the level of consensus on this issue that even Migration Watch and UKIP have joined those calls. The only question that remains is whether the rights that flow from permanent residency and the opportunity for those eligible to obtain those rights in the future will be secured by means of a reciprocal agreement or unilaterally guaranteed by the government. I, I won't give way, if that's okay, because I know there are many uh, honourable members who wish to get in. I don't think the front bench should take the majority of time. We recognise the efforts of the Prime Minister and her ministers to achieve, to achieve a reciprocal agreement with our EU partners that would also guarantee the rights of UK nationals in other EU countries. We owe a duty to our nationals in those countries, and securing their rights must remain a priority. But with no reciprocal agreement reached, and with just weeks to go until the triggering of Article 50, we believe the uncertainty must be brought to an end by unilateral action on the part of the government. I'm not going to give way, I'm not going to give way any further. There are hard-headed as well as moral reasons for doing so. Guaranteeing the rights of residents of EU nationals unilaterally at the date at which the Article 50 notice is given would not only end the uncertainty that millions now face, it would ensure the best possible start to the negotiations ahead and would send a clear signal to the small minority who have treated the referendum result as a licence to victimise others that our fellow Europeans are welcome and will remain so. Madam Deputy Speaker, a number of other new clauses and amendments share the purpose outlined in New Clause 6 in seeking to protect the rights of EU nationals living in the UK. Indeed, some add additional safeguards to the basic guarantee we seek. In particular, new clause 57, which stands in the name of my honourable friend, the member for Camberwell and Peckham, would not only ensure the residents' rights of EU citizens are protected, but would also ensure that those rights do not automatically fall away at the end of the Article 50 negotiating period if no agreement has been reached. And if my right honourable friend were minded to push it to the vote, she would have our support. What matters in the end is that this issue is resolved urgently in order to end the anxiety that individuals are currently feeling and the distress that will be caused by a prolonged period of uncertainty during the negotiations. I hope that ministers can provide us and the thousands of EU nationals and their family members out there with the reassurances we seek on this matter. New clause, parliamentary oversight of negotiations. The question is that new clause three be read a second time Mr Mark Harper. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs Lang. Um, I, I note that the group is a, a fairly hefty one. There are a large number of uh, amendments, but I only wish to make five points, so I will uh, attempt not to take too much of the House's time. Um, the first point that I wish to address is the, the one that the Honourable Gentleman moved at the beginning of his remarks on parliamentary scrutiny. Uh, and there are a number of other uh, new clauses and amendments um, which talk about producing a raft of, of, uh, of reports, including the, the rather large number of new clauses from the uh, Honourable Member, the Member for Nottingham East. Um, and what I really wanted to just throw out there is what that really adds to the process. It seems to me, uh, as a Member of Parliament, I also, having talked to a number of my constituents, it seems to me that this House has spent a lot of time, as is appropriate, debating Brexit and all of the issues that flow from it. My, Right Honourable Friend, the Prime Minister has been here on a number of occasions. My Right Honourable Friend, the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union, has made a number of statements. And it seems to me ministers actually have furnished the House with a significant amount of information. And uh, in the white paper which was published last week, which I read very carefully, there was a commitment, a reiteration of the commitment to bring forward the Great Repeal Bill, which will be very wide in scope and will enable Parliament to debate these matters. There was also the suggestion that it's very likely there will be primary legislation brought forward on immigration and customs matters. That, of course, will be debated uh, by the House. Of course, I'll give way. Um, I would agree with him that, uh, that 
there is a vast amount of, of information already coming out there. Would he agree with me, though, that even if that cooperative attitude were to change, there are plenty of mechanisms available to all of us in this place, both on the government side and on the opposition side, including urgent questions and the like, to bring ministers to the dispatch box to provide the kind of explanation which everybody here is expecting? And would you agree with me, therefore, that I, it's very hard to see how the opposition's proposals build or add to those mechanisms which are already available to all of us? Well, I, I completely agree with my uh, honourable friend, and it's, it's difficult to avoid uh, the conclusion that the, certainly the front bench was, uh, on, the, on the other side was desperately looking around for things they could uh, bring forward to amend the bill which wouldn't uh, stop it uh, in its tracks, and uh, I think this was about the best they could uh, come up with, uh, but I think it doesn't really add very much um, and is rather unnecessary. And as I said, there are rather a lot of new clauses that are rather repetitive, talking about uh, reports and information about a whole raft of EU institutions, which will of course be covered. The Honourable Gentleman, give me just one moment to conclude my point, um, which will be covered uh, in any event. Now, I saw my uh, right honourable friend first, and then I'll give way. Actually. The effect, if not the intent, of the opposition new clause would be to make all these matters justiciable and therefore bring the courts into the question yes. whether the government's reports were sufficient and indeed whether they were appropriate. My right honourable friend makes a very good point. Once you put things into primary legislation and you set out the nature and terms of the report, as we have seen, it will be justiciable and it will allow people to then go off to uh, court and argue. They may be successful, they may not, but they will certainly be able to argue that what the government has brought forward isn't adequate, uh, and we will then have a, a continuation of the legal uh, arguments uh, that we have seen. The Honourable Gentleman. To the Honourable Gentleman, but shouldn't any member of this House, as, as a minimum requirement, want to have access to information and opportunities at least equal to those of any member of the European Parliament? Surely no member of, part of this House can justify arguing for anything less. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I think the point I was making, and I think my honourable friend, the member for Western Supermare, was agreeing that there are already well established mechanisms in this House for ensuring information is brought before members. And indeed, if I just simply judge my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, by what they've done so far, it seems to me they've been in this House frequently talking about Brexit. Now, I fear by the end of this process, uh, certainly the general public uh, will, I think, be willing it to end very quickly, and indeed maybe even members of the House, uh, of course. The problems that what we've had in recent years is that motions are carried by this House quite regularly and then completely and utterly ignored by the Government. And so what we need now is not just a simple vote at the end, yes or no. We need to be able to scrutinise whatever deal there is, line by line, which is precisely what the European Parliament will be able to do. So why on earth shouldn't we be able to do it? That honourable gentleman rose to his feet because I was going to turn away from my first point about the new clauses brought forward by the opposition front bench to the ones that I think are much more damaging, new clause 51, uh, on which the honourable member for Rhonda's name is uh, appended, and also amendment 44. Now, in the motion passed by the House on the 7th of December last year, uh, which was a government amendment to uh, the opposition motion, the House agreed by, a major, uh, by 448 votes to 75 that the Government should indeed make sure that Parliament had the information available to properly scrutinise these matters, but it also said, and it was instruction from the House, that there should be no disclosure of material that could be reasonably judged to damage the UK. Now, this is of course an arguable matter, but it would be my contention that new clause 51, with the detail it suggests that we bring forward in terms of future trading arrangements, the terms of proposed trade agreements, the proposed status of citizens uh, uh, and so forth, are measures that we wouldn't want to disclose as we negotiate that future, future trading arrangements. We, for example, wouldn't want to disclose uh, if there were going to be tariffs brought in or not, what level they should be at. It seems to me that is indeed giving away our negotiating hand and it's counter to the strongly expressed view of the House. So I hope that if uh, either new clause 51 or amendments 44 are put to the vote, I would strongly urge the House to 
uh, 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 vote against them. The, of course I will. The Orchins uh, Amendment, New Clause 51, which is in my name and the name of uh, honourable members on this side of the House, given that the government of which he was a part before the referendum said that they thought the damage to the UK's GDP of our leaving the EU on WTO terms was around 7.7% of GDP, or perhaps as much as £66 billion, would he not think it sensible of the government to allay concerns in the country if the government now believes the effect is going to be far lesser? Well, the, uh, the, the Honourable Gentleman, of course, is picking out one aspect uh, of his new clause. I was drawing out the, one of the aspects uh, which I objected to, which was about effectively disclosing uh, our hand in the discussions of future trading arrangements. And I don't think if we're trying to carry out a negotiation with our trading partners, that is very sensible. Uh, moving on to the third point. That I, uh, uh, of course, he tempts me. <laughs> Grateful for him for being tempted. Trade is another big area where the government was very clear prior to the referendum as to what the impacts on trade of our leaving the EU would be, and now we have no information as to whether there is going to be more trade or less trade with the EU or with the constituent countries within it. Does it not simply seem sensible to tell the country whether we will have more trade with the EU yeah. or less? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Seems Flaws in what the Honourable Gentleman is suggesting is all of the matters to which he refers are, of course, <laughs> forecasts, and they are uh, estimates or guesses of, uh, of what people... If my Honourable Friend just will forgive me. Are estimates. Now, all I would say is a number of estimates and forecasts were made on both sides of the arguments, leave and remain, uh, prior to the referendum. And uh, whilst I'm not an expert on these matters myself, it seems to me that not all of those uh, forecasts and assessments have entirely panned out the way people thought they would. So why producing large documents full of equally erroneous forecasts is entirely helpful, uh, I really don't know. My old friend. I'm right on, the exchange just revealed the foolhardiness of actually revealing our hand at this stage, given the fact that we can't officially strike any kind of bilateral trade deal until we actually leave uh, the EU. And we want to avoid talking our country down when every trade deal and every relationship we have, even, yes, with the United States, is going to be of paramount importance. We should do everything to resist a temptation to insult those from those countries coming here as well. Well, I agree with my right honourable friend Moore, and I think that demonstrates the expertise that he acquired when he was a, a minister in the Foreign Office. Um, uh, um, Mrs. Lang, moving on to point number three of my five, New Clause 56 uh, talks about uh, our withdrawal from the EEA and tries to make that into a separate argument. Now, it seems to me, looking at the terms of uh, our membership of the EEA, which we are a member of as a result of being a member of the European Union. Given that the EEA agreement talks about the free movement of goods and persons uh, and also means that we are susceptible to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, it seems to me that if we were to remain within the EEA, um, we would effectively, uh, in the view of, I would think, most uh, members of the public, not really have left the European Union at all, because the things that they were concerned about uh, would still be enforced, and indeed things would have got worse, because we would have no ability to influence... Well, let me just finish that point. Uh, we would have no ability to influence the rules that we were then having to take, and it seems to me that I think those members that are trying to talk about the EEA are simply trying to avoid the fact that we are going to be leaving the European well, Union. They're trying to remain within it by the back door. Let me give way to the Honourable Gentleman first. I think he was first on his feet, then my Honourable Friend. Can he confirm that Norway is not in the European Union and that Norway has been cited by leaving uh, leading Leave campaigners as an option we could have followed and we could be like Norway and not within the European Union? Um, to the House, uh, that Norway isn't a member of the European Union, as is indeed true. Uh, I have to say, though, part of the reason why I was on the Remain side of the argument was I don't think the Norway deal is a very good one at all and not a model to be followed. My, my view was, well, let me finish answering the Honourable Gentleman's point, and then I, of course, will take an intervention. I did promise my Honourable Friend first, and then the Honourable Lady. The, the point is, 
I think the two best options are you're either in the EU and you take all the things that come with it, but you can at least shape the rules, or you leave and you're not in the single market, you don't have to have free movement of people, and you're not subject to the ECJ. The EEA model that Norway has, I think, actually is, the, is, is a really a poor option because you're subject to free movement of people, you have to accept the jurisdiction of the court, uh, and you have no right at all to influence any of the rules. And I don't think that is a model. That, I mean, it's up to the Norwegians what model they want to adopt, but I don't think it's a model that works for us, and it's not one that I would recommend to the House. My honourable friend. I, I thank my honourable, my right honourable friend uh, for giving me one. I, I actually am in complete agreement with him on these particular points. And I have to say, does he not also think that? These constructs, such as the EEA, etc., are effectively anti chambers. They're entry points into the EU. And it's inappropriate for a country of our size and our economy, which is exiting the EU, to basically rest in something that is inappropriate. Well, I, I completely agree with you. I couldn't have put it uh, better uh, myself. The Honourable Lady. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. I just wonder whether he could tell the House whether he believes that Parliament. Uh, should vote on whether we leave the single market and the EEA before that happens, if indeed that is what the government uh, wants to see through. I don't specifically. I, I listened as a participant to the uh, arguments in the referendum campaign very clearly, and, and I was on for cards on the table. I was on the Remain side of the argument, but I'm a Democrat, so I accept the result. It seemed to me it was very clear. Um, David Cameron, when he was Prime Minister, uh, and the uh, Right Honourable Member for Tatton, when he was Chancellor, on the, uh, le leading the Remain campaign, were very clear that if the country voted to leave the European Union, we would be leaving the single market. Now, uh, both of my, uh, David Cameron and my Right Honourable Friend, the Member for Tatton, both thought, erroneously as it turned out, that that argument would be the slam dunk, the one that the British people would say being in the single market was absolutely critical and therefore the British public would vote to remain in the European Union. Let, could, if I could just finish my answer and then of course I will take an uh, intervention. Um, however, the British public didn't agree with my uh, with David Cameron and my right honourable friend, and it seems to me very clear, therefore, that they accepted that we would be leaving the single market. And leading campaigners on the Leave side of the argument made exactly the same point. My right honourable friend. Uh, it's quite right that the uh, then Prime Minister and Chancellor did indeed warn that leaving yeah. being leaving the single market. But my recollection is some Leave campaigners just dismissed that as project fear. And, and I particularly recollect that the current Foreign Secretary was totally dismissive of that argument and says that quite obviously we would retain full membership, full access to the market, because they needed to sell us their Mercedes and their Prosecco wine. And it's not true that everybody on the Leave side acknowledged that we were going to put outside, ourselves outside tariff barriers and outside regulatory barriers. Well, my my, um, my, my right honourable friend uh, is, of course, right that not everybody on the Leave side did make that argument. The good news uh, for me is that I wasn't on the Leave side of the argument, so I don't feel any obligation, uh, and my right honourable friend wasn't either, so I, I don't feel any obligation to defend any of the arguments made by anybody on that side of the campaign, um, which I'm very relieved about. Um, I was specifically chose the former Prime Minister and the former Chancellor because they were on my side of the argument, but I, I think I'm right in saying that the Right Honourable Member for Surrey Heath, who was leading the uh, official Leave campaign, made exactly that argument, uh, and, I, and I, so that's why I referred to it. Um, let me give way to the Honourable Lady. Thank you for giving way to the Chair of the Official Leave campaign, who, whilst there were many voices to argue for Leave, the Official Leave campaign the chair and the chairs of the campaign committee made this very clear in public. Boris. Voting to leave would mean to leave the single market. Very grateful to the Honourable Lady for that very helpful intervention, which rather proved uh, my point. So I think that the decision the British people made in the referendum meant leaving the EU, which means leaving the single market, uh, and I think that's the conclusion that the Prime Minister has drawn and one which I support. Um, let, if, if, if the Honourable Gentleman forgive me, I want to move on to my fourth point, which is to talk about the very important issue um, of, of EU nationals. Now, there's a number of issues here, and I, I hope 
Given my experience as a former immigration minister, I can at least raise some questions which I think those members participating in the debate, and I hope the minister, when he responds to this group of amendments, is able to deal with to my satisfaction and the satisfaction of the House. The first point I would make is I completely agree that it would be desirable to be able to put at rest the minds and concerns of EU nationals in the United yeah. Kingdom who are here lawfully and contributing to our country. Uh, I think that's very important. Let, let me just finish my opening remarks on this point and then, of course, I'll take her intervention. But I also think it is important to be able to put at rest the concerns and worries of British citizens living elsewhere in the European Union, because, after all, the primary duty of the British government is to look out for British citizens. That comes first ahead of all else. And I fear that what the honourable gentleman from the opposition front bench was suggesting was effectively when he said that if we couldn't reach an early agreement we should proceed anyway, was that may well put at rest the concerns of EU nationals in Britain, but it seemed to me it was simply throwing overboard the interests and concerns of UK citizens living elsewhere in the European Union. We would not have secured their interests and would have thrown away uh, our ability to do so. The Honourable Lady. Gentlemen, for giving way. 15% um, of the academic staff, 5% of students, and 10% of research students in Cardiff University, in my constituency, are from the EU. Does he agree with me that there's a significant risk that, that, that the EU staff and their spouses will seek employment elsewhere outside the UK if they don't have certainty now from the government and we lose all that intellectual capital? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, lady, which is why I'm very pleased that the Prime Minister, in the statement that she made today and on a number of other occasions has made it clear that she wants to reach an early agreement and has been seeking to do so with our European partners. But what the Prime Minister has to do in leading our country is look at the interests of British citizens as well as citizens from other EU countries who are here. And she does not serve the interests of British citizens by putting the interests of EU nationals ahead of them. The Honourable Lady. To the Honourable Gentleman for giving way, he's very courteous. Um, I'm a member of the Exiting the EU Select Committee, and we heard evidence from a number of British nationals living in Spain, Germany, Italy, and France a few weeks ago, and they were members of representative organisations of other British nationals. Every single one of them said that they felt if the UK government made a unilateral guarantee of the rights of EU nationals yeah. living here, then the other member states would reciprocate. Has he uh, taken that evidence into account? Yeah. Yeah. I have, uh, and the Honourable Lady has obviously now put it in front of the House. Uh, but the problem is I haven't seen any evidence of that. And I mean, it's right, if I listen correctly to what the Prime Minister was saying, it sounds indeed that there are a number of European uh, member state governments who are indeed of that that view, but there, there clearly are, are at least more than one who are not of that view, or at least not of that view now, and I think therefore it's, it's sensible to get this right. I do think also one other thing that members of this House ought to be doing, picking up the point uh, I think from the Honourable Gentleman for Leicester East, is there are a number of mechanisms for those EU nationals who have lived in the United Kingdom for some time to actually already sort out their uh, resident status on a permanent basis, and I think actually members of this House, rather than scaremongering, would do well to put that information in front of their constituents to reassure them rather than whipping up uh, concern. Let me take the Honourable Lady once more. Uh, the point that these British nationals living abroad made was this, that it's the British government that has put this matter on the table, yes. that's put the rights of these people at issue, and therefore it's the British government that should take the lead by guaranteeing the rights of EU nationals living in the UK, and then other member states would uh, follow suit. Now, those are not my words. Those are the words of British nationals living abroad. What does he have to say to that? I go back to the premise of her question. It wasn't the British government that made this decision. It was the decision of the British people yeah. for us to leave well no it isn't it isn't the same thing with the with the greatest 
respect. The reason why these issues have, have come up, why there is a question about the rights of EU nationals and British citizens, is because, is because the people of the United Kingdom decided that we were going to leave the European Union. That's why the question is, it's not a decision of the government. So let me know, if, 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 um, if, 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 if members will forgive me, let me, let me make a, a lit. Well, I will give way to the Chairman of the Treasury Select Committee, but then I must make some progress. I'm very grateful indeed to my right honourable friend for giving way. He would agree, though, wouldn't he, that other nationals uh, should not be treated as bargaining chips. And he would also, I'm sure, be aware that the Treasury Committee has heard a good deal of evidence uh, to suggest that the failure to guarantee the rights of EU nationals is now beginning to damage the economy. Uh, given that and the overwhelming ethical case, doesn't he agree on reflection that the time has come now just to protect the citizens' rights? I, I, don't, I completely agree with the, the value to the economy, and I completely agree with him that it's an urgent matter. And I heard the Prime Minister say exactly that this afternoon. But um, if I maybe just uh, conclude my remarks on EU nationals, and then perhaps my honourable friend will see why I don't think precipitate action uh, is very wise, because actually it could open up a whole range of complexities, which far from. Well, let, let me just finish this. Let me just finish responding to the. Honourable gentlemen, before I take the honourable lady's intervention, far from putting people's minds at rest, could actually make things worse rather than better. The honourable lady. But he was a minister who negotiated. If we are putting on the table a deal which is the kind of deal which we would expect the other 27 to offer to UK citizens, we would A, set the template of what we think the right deal is, and B, set the right tone for the negotiations. This is different from trade. I don't think, actually, in a way, what the Honourable Lady is suggesting. It sounds to me, I was listening very carefully to what the Prime Minister said. It sounds to me the Prime Minister is indeed, uh, and her ministers, talking to EU member states and actually trying to get this issue resolved. Because th it seems to me there's a two stage process here. There's an agreement in principle by the United Kingdom Government with other EU member states. Well, look, I I'm very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for trying to intervene. I'm trying to answer the hon I, I need to finish replying to the Honourable Lady before I can take his intervention. I'm also conscious that I want... I've only got one more point to make after I've finished my points on EU nationals, and I want to give other members the chance to contribute to the debate. So, um, let me just finish... Well, I, I'm, giving way, I'm giving way to questions that I've been asked. This is a debate. I can't both make rapid progress and give way to honourable gentlemen, uh, honourable ladies. So let me just answer the point that the honourable lady made. It seems to me that the Prime Minister and her ministers are indeed dealing with other European member states. They're trying to get this issue resolved. It seems to me that it's clearly not being entirely reciprocated by other member states. And the approach, it seems to me, needs to be twofold. It needs to be an agreement in principle that we want to guarantee those rights. But there's also an awful lot of detail to be worked out, and these matters are very complicated. For it, and I just want to draw the attention of the House to what happened last weekend. It seems to me that part of the reason for the mess that the uh, US administration has got itself into is that it produced an executive order. As far as I can tell, looking from outside, it doesn't seem to have been very well thought through. They don't seem to have taken proper legal advice. Uh, they've then got themselves into trouble in courts. There was an impact on British citizens before the intervention uh, of my right honourable friends, the Foreign Secretary and the Home Secretary, resolve that matter. Uh, and I don't want us to move precipitately without thinking this through. And I'll just give the House some examples of things that I think have to be sorted out. The various amendments and new clauses talk about people who are lawfully resident uh, in the United Kingdom under the existing treaties. Now, people think that is very straightforward, but it's actually quite complicated. Any EU national can come to Britain for any reason for up to three months. But if they want to stay here for longer than three months, they've either got to be working, looking for work, self-sufficient or a student. If they're self-sufficient or a student, they're only lawfully here if they have comprehensive health insurance. And we know from those people who have been trying to regularise their status, following the very sensible advice from the member for Leicester East, that many people haven't got that comprehensive health insurance, so aren't actually technically here lawfully at all. So I think we just need to be very clear when we use these phrases, because people won't be aware of the complexity. Who are we granting the rights to? Because 
if we're going to give people clarity and certainty, we've got to be very clear about what it is we're doing. The second thing, um, and, and people will know this is topical at the moment, is about the National Health Service and healthcare. We currently have a set of reciprocal arrangements with our European Union partners for people who are in those countries. We don't do as well as they do about logging and doing the administration and collecting the money, but we also want to make sure that is going to work uh, when we've left the European Union. I don't know where we're going to end up on that, but it is also very important. The point that I alluded to in my intervention early, which I think is something which has got to be thought about, or we will, if we act hastily, we will come to regret it. There are four, at the end of March last year, which are the latest figures I've been able to find, there were over 4,000, there were 4,222 EU nationals who are currently imprisoned in British jails. Now, under the EU Prisoner Transfer Framework Directive, we have an ability when they uh, come out of prison, or we have the ability to transfer when they're in prison, but when they come out of prison, we can start taking action to revoke their status in the United Kingdom. I want to make sure that in acting now, we don't act hastily and make our ability to remove those people from the United Kingdom more difficult. And I fear that the new clauses and amendments on the order paper that are in front of us today don't adequately, and I think that was reflected by the answer from the Shadow Spokesman, don't adequately deal with that issue. The final point I will make uh, is that the bill before us does one simple thing. It's to give the Prime Minister lawful authority to start the negotiation process. That's all it does. I think the government have been very generous in the time they've made available to debate that matter. Uh, and I think the bill, as it's currently drafted, does not need to be improved or amended in any way. And I would urge the House... I don't know which amendments and new clauses are going to be put forward today. I hope I've set out some reasons why a number of them should be rejected, but I would urge Madam, uh, uh, Mrs Lang, if any of them are put forward today, I would urge the House to reject them. Harriet Harman. Madam Deputy Speaker, I rise to support new clause uh, 57, standing in my name and the names of other members of the Joint Committee on Human Rights, um, and with the support of honourable and right honourable members on all sides of the House. This is about three million people and their families, EU citizens whose future here has been thrown into doubt by the decision in June that the UK should leave the EU. There's nothing about the cloud of uncertainty that they now live under, which is their own fault. And we can, if we agree this new clause, put their minds at rest and let them look to the future. Honourable members on all sides of the House will know these people whose lives we're talking about here. Some, like those from France and Spain, have been here for decades. They have children and grandchildren living here. They work in and are part of their local community. It is unthinkable that they would be deported, their families divided, because we've decided to leave the EU. So let's put their minds at rest and assure them and their families that our decision to leave the EU won't change their right to be here. Their anxiety is palpable. We've all seen it in our advice surgeries, like the Italian woman, my constituent, who came to see me, who's been here for 30 years, who can't work anymore because she's now ill and whose residency rights are now at risk. Some, like those from countries that came more recently into the EU, like Poland, Romania and Bulgaria, are working in sectors that couldn't manage without them, in agriculture, in care homes and in our tourist industry. Employers in food production are already reporting more difficulty That's in right. getting the workers they exactly. need. This is happening now. I give way to my honourable friend. Exactly. I'm most grateful to her. And of course, this is an amendment which was recommended by the Joint Committee on Human Rights of both houses. Um, but would she agree with me that we're seeing people such as my constituent, who is a consultant paediatric surgeon from Sweden, who approached me over the new year most distressed because he wasn't sure about his future status and he performs really valuable services to the people of West Midlands in Birmingham Children's Hospital and he'd been given advice that he should seek the services of an immigration lawyer and that advice had come from his trust. Well, the Honourable Member is absolutely right and this, there was plenty of evidence on this that came before us in the Joint Committee on Human Rights of which he is a very valued member. 
Um, this ongoing uncertainty around the status of EU residents here is allowing greater exploitation of vulnerable EU workers. Last week, appearing before the Joint Committee on Human Rights, Margaret Beals, chair of the Gangmasters Licensing Authority, said that evidence is coming into them that gangmasters are telling fearful EU workers that they can't complain about not being paid or being subjected to unsafe conditions because if they do, they'll be deported as they no longer have the right to be here. Mr. Madam Deputy Speaker, we are not whipping up fears. We are understanding fears and seeking to address them. It is no good, I'm afraid, the government issuing warm words. People need certainty. They work in every part of our private sector. They contribute to our creative industries. They're artists, musicians. They work in our public services. If, if you've been, I will in a moment, if you've been in hospital recently, you will very likely have woken to find a Spanish or a Portuguese nurse at your bedside. If you've got an older relative in a care home, you'll very likely see them being cared for by someone from Eastern Europe. I give way to the Honourable The Right Honourable Lady for giving way, and I have considerable sympathy uh, with the point she's making, but we disagree on the fundamental point, I think, which is that surely we should not do something unilateral here in the United Kingdom before we've got agreement about our own residents in Spain and France and elsewhere because we will be undermining, potentially undermining their position because they are no doubt feeling the same sense of vulnerability as the one that she's just articulated about those living here. Agree, I'm afraid, with the uh, honourable gentleman's conclusion. I give way to my honourable friend, my right honourable friend. Uh, is my right honourable friend aware that we also heard evidence in the Home Affairs Select Committee from community groups representing Polish community and other Eastern European communities who said that they had seen increase in hate crime and that they experienced that extremists were exploiting the uncertainty to attack people with uh, phrases like "go home." and saying that people should leave the country and that the uncertainty that EU citizens felt made it harder for them to deal with these awful hate crimes they were experiencing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My right honourable friend is absolutely right um, in the point that she makes. Um, it's not just... I will give way. <coughs> right honourable lady for giving way. I'm sure many MPs in this chamber have also had constituents from the EU who have tried to seek security by applying for permanent residency and have been turned down yep. and have yep. received yep. prepare to leave letters. Yep. The member from Shocking. the Forest of Dean mentions comprehensive health insurance. There is no such thing. You cannot get 100% comprehensive health insurance and previously the NHS was recognised as giving health cover. So why can we not in this House give these people at least security on this end and not threaten to throw them out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well said. Absolutely agree uh, with the honourable member. Um, it's not just they and their families that are worried about the uncertainty that is hanging over them. So are employers for whom they're working. How will our NHS find the nurses we need if they seek work elsewhere because they fear they won't be allowed to stay? It's not as if we're training them ourselves. Absolutely. This year, with the cuts in bursaries, nursing student numbers have fallen by 23%. Exactly. Madam Deputy Speaker, Would this new like clause to, is quite simple. Point. I'll give way. It's very kind, it's very, very kind of give way. Did she realise I had a conversation just recently with the, ch the chair of my trust and chief executive of my trust who said if it wasn't for the young Spanish nurses, Huddersfield uh, uh, Hospital couldn't operate. And another conversation with the LSE where they said if we don't have the Europeans who are good at maths and science, 20% of the workforce in universities would go back to them. Well, I think my honourable friend is absolutely right. We can't be saying we welcome them here to do this work, but use them in a bargaining chip with European negotiations. On that point, this can, can, I give way to my honourable friend. I thank my honourable friend for giving way. She's been very generous with her time. Just on that point, um, I've had in my surgery constituents coming in in tears and threatening what will happen to them next and their job. And we should not, it's not a British value, does my honourable friend agree with me, that we use people as bargaining chips yeah. in this negotiation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I absolutely agree with my uh, honourable friend. 
I'll just give way once more, and then. I'll... I thank the right honourable lady for giving way. She is sending out a very powerful message about British values, and I think a, a, a point that is shared right across this house about the importance of giving certainty to EU nationals living here. Can I, though, therefore, press her about why we are? why we need to be careful not to send an equivalent message to British nationals living in the rest of the EU that they are somehow less important and that their concerns equally valid, equally severely felt, equally worried about that what is going to happen to them are somehow not going to be any subject which we are going to address here today or indeed take any count of. Because you simply cannot trade one off Absolutely. against the other like that. This is not an economic trade negotiation. This new clause, Madam Deputy Speaker, is quite simple. It says that if you are an EU citizen and you were a lawful resident here before the referendum decision on June the 23rd, then your rights of residence will remain unchanged. We need this clause in the bill because the government has been sending out mixed messages, yeah. and the Prime Minister did so again in her statement today. Yeah, On yeah. the one hand, she says, no one who's lawfully here has anything to worry about. Mm. On the other hand, she says that she can't commit to giving them residency rights because their future must be part of the negotiations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just cannot feel that it is any way right to use the lives of three million people and their families as a bargaining chip. They and their families are not pawns in a game of poker with the EU. They cannot be used as a human shield as we battle it out in Europe for our UK citizens in other countries abroad. We must decide what is fair and right for, citizen, for EU citizens here and then do it. I thought we were supposed to be taking back control. Absolutely. If the government rejects this new clause, then EU citizens will be right to draw the conclusion that their rights to continue to live here could be snatched away if our government doesn't get what it wants for our UK citizens living in each of the other countries in Europe. This new clause is not only the right thing to do as a matter of principle, it is legally necessary. The government cannot bargain away people's human rights. The right to family life is guaranteed by Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. If the government bargained them away, EU citizens living here would be able to go to our courts and seek to establish their rights to remain under Article 8. If even 10 per cent of those here did that, there would be 300,000 court challenges. There is no way our court system could begin to cope with that. This new clause, I hope, will be accepted by the government. But if not, I urge members of all parties to support it in the division line. Sir William Cash. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, could I just simply say, first of all, that uh, the member for Dorset West was in the chamber a short time ago, and he made a very important point on this particular clause. Uh, when you're imposing legal requirements and duties uh, on uh, anybody, let alone the Prime Minister, you have to be sure that what you're doing is actually capable of being realised. And I'm afraid to say that um, certainly uh, the, uh, uh, my own right honourable friend, the member for Forest, the Dean, dealt comprehensively with the question, and did, as did other members in interventions, with the difficulties that arise in relation to that part of this new clause, which talks about laying uh, periodic reports um, on the progress of negotiations. I mean, th 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 I think that case has been made. But when we move on to the next part, the real problem is this, that um, first of all, uh, with respect to subparagraph uh, C, to make arrangements for parliamentary scrutiny of confidential documents. I, I have to say to the House that as Chairman of the European Scrutiny Committee, uh, I have had one enormous amount of trouble over and over again uh, about what documents uh, which are described as limite. Uh, limite means documents which are distributed but are not allowed to be referred to uh, by um, uh, other parliaments when they're distributed uh, because they have this nature of confidentiality. Now, I happen to think some of this um, is overdone. 
and I have made that position quite clear. But I have to say that to try to impose a legal duty on the Prime Minister to give an undertaking to break the rules relating to limited documents is really stretching a point to the point of, uh, uh, of absurdity. And I, do, uh, I will certainly give way. I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman. I just want to ask the same question as uh, I asked of his colleague who spoke earlier, and that is, shouldn't he be arguing, as somebody who has spent a great deal of his time in Parliament scrutinising the European Union, be arguing for members of this House to say, have the same rights of scrutiny, yeah, yeah. at least equal to those of the European, members of the European Parliament? I have enormous sympathy with that, and in point of fact, uh, the, uh, my right hon. Friend, the member for uh, Brexit, uh, has made clear in the, in, in the House of Lords, he gave evidence, and as I understand it, he made it abundantly clear that any document that would be made available to the uh, European Parliament uh, would, and its committees would indeed be made available to this House. So, to that extent, not only do I agree with the honourable gentleman, but I also believe it's unnecessary, and it's not necessary because it's already been given by way of, a, as I understand, an undertaking by the Secretary of State. Yes. Um, given, I'm grateful to my uh, right honourable friend. Given that new clause three, uh, section C, says make arrangements for parliamentary scrutiny of confidential documents. In his wide experience, how long does he think the contents of those documents would remain confidential if they were made available for wide parliamentary scrutiny? Well, they certainly would not. Uh, and that is really the purpose of this limite restriction which has been imposed. And although I do have reservations about it in certain cases, I can think of a number of instances where it's absolutely vital that they, re they remain confidential. And indeed, if there were to be any breach of it, and it would have to be released by an undertaking by the Prime Minister that she would release it, it could actually completely gum up the works to such an extent in relation to matters of intelligence and security and all sorts of things that actually we would end up uh, with not receiving any documents at all which came under the rubric of limite. So I'm afraid to say, if I, with uh, great respect, and the honourable gentleman who led from the front bench uh, may or may not have been dealing with these matters for some time, and I'm not going to criticise him for that. But I will say that, no, no, it's a perfectly fair point. All I'm saying is in drafting this, uh, if you end up with something that doesn't work, and you have to comply with paragraphs A, B and C to make it work, as the member for Dorset West said, uh, you, you then end up in the courts, because there would be judicial review over this, believe, it or, believe me there would. It naturally follows, and that's all I need to say, that the, the clause, new clause simply is nonsense. And it can't therefore be brought into effect because it doesn't make sense and it can't be brought into effect. That is all I need to say on that particular new clause. Stephen Gethins. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, first of all, if I can move the amendments in my name and that of my honourable colleagues, and also say that uh, I'm glad that we have the opportunity to discuss and debate this issue over the coming days. We've been given very little um, time in which to do so, but I think it's uh, fair to say that this is not scrutiny that the government either welcomed or encouraged. So it's good at least to have a short opportunity to debate this. Um, I have to say that I think this says more about the confidence that they have in their own arguments and ability to deliver a better deal with the EU partners than the one we have at present than it does anything to do with the scrutiny process. Um, the government have been dragged kicking and screaming to this chamber just to have a vote on Article 50 in the first place. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, we had the situation on Thursday, the last sitting day when the White Paper was introduced, when we got the White Paper as the Secretary of State was getting to his feet. I thought that was pretty disrespectful of the entire House. Um, it failed to put my mind at ease, and I'm sure it failed to put the mind at ease of many of the MPs in this chamber about the way that the government is conducting this process. Although, Madam Deputy Speaker, I think it's something of a metaphor for the entire Brexit process. It was rushed without time for proper scrutiny, and it didn't even get all its facts right. Quite remarkable, given the amount of time that they had to prepare the White Paper. Um, this could not be a more important process, and actually one of the most important processes that anybody in this House will ever take 
part in. I certainly think it's a more important process than that of the debate over wigs or any other crucial um, <laughs> debate that that side do want to debate at the moment. Um, this will have an impact on us all and on all of our constituents, <laughs> given the uh, health of the economy, the jobs and taxes that are generated as a result. Now, against some fairly stiff composition, uh, competition, some people have argued that the craziest political decision of 2016 was the one to elect Donald Trump president. Incidentally, one that, um, um, we, and we certainly welcome the Speaker's announcement today. But the good people of the United States of America, should they wish to do so, have the ability to reverse the decision that they made in November, and one that we do not have any likelihood of reversing any time soon. So although the four years might seem a long way away for many in the United States, here, the mistakes that are made by the government, any lack of scrutiny as a result, will be felt down the generations of policymakers in this place that we represent and in time beyond. For such a big decision, the ability to have any meaningful scrutiny is woeful. The role of Parliament is to scrutinise the work of government regardless of the vote, and that is the entire point in us sitting here and having a Parliament in the first place. I will remind this side of the House that the SNP won the election earlier on this year with 47 per cent of the vote, the high after, after the highest proportion of the vote. No, no, it was an election I hear from um, last year. Actually, the Holyrood election took place this year, which tells you all you need to know about the attention that they pay to this, um, during this kind of year. During, and also, in 2015, we won the vote with 47 per cent. They won the election with 36 per cent of the vote. Although I'm particularly pleased to say that Scotland dragged down their UK average by some considerable degree on that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. However, there is a role of opposition parties, be it in Holyrood or be it in this place, to hold the government to account for the enormity of the decisions that they take that impact each and every one of us. This process to leave the European Union will involve one of the greatest upheavals since this Parliament came into existence in 1801. And we should be given a lot more time to consider the implications of that on our constituents, on the economy and on our European partners than we are being given at present. That is why, on this side of the House, we will back any moves to give this Parliament a greater deal of scrutiny over that. That scrutiny and the importance of scrutiny is made all the more important by the lack of detail that was provided by members of the Vote Leave campaign, an act of irresponsibility carried out by members, who were, uh, members of the government previously and those who are members of the government at, um, at present. There are significant questions that were left unanswered during that debate. And since Vote Leave did not bother giving us the details, we have a responsibility as parliamentarians to ask for those details. <coughs> One of them is, do we stay in the single market? The Prime Minister's speech obviously differs from the Conservative Party manifesto on which she and other members on the House opposite were elected. Is it the case that it would be for Scotland to decide its immigration numbers? And, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, how much extra cash is the NHS getting? All of these questions, which we deserved answers before any triggering of Article, um, Article 50 took pray, place, who is accountable, after all, for the promises that were made? That is an answer that I have not received so far, and I have not heard any other members um, receiving so far. On the point of EU nationals, and I know that a number of my colleagues will want to touch upon this during the debate, it is easy to see why we are backing the amendments in order to give EU nationals the right to remain. We are richer financially and culturally as a result of European nationals who call Scotland and other parts of the UK <laughs> home. <laughs> and on that point, I'll get I'm, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend. He's making some very valid points. But will we not also be judged by the leadership that we give them by our humanity? And those EU citizens that are here are our friends, our, our neighbours, our work colleagues. And we have a duty to stand by the rights that they have and the Prime Minister must send out a very clear message that those here are welcome to stay here. We must remove that uncertainty and do it now. Yeah. My honourable friend, as usual, makes a very pertinent point. We'll and indeed, and indeed, I won't make it at the moment, but I'll, I'll, I'll come on to that. 
Um, my honourable friend, let, let me just deal with this point, and then I'll be glad to, 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 to come to, to one from the, um, from the government benches. Um, my honourable friend makes a good point, and I, um, and I pay due respect to the work that he's done for the Brain families and others in his constituency in some of the, the very disgraceful immigration cases that we've seen. In terms of EU nationals, these are people who have chosen to make the UK their home and chosen to make Scotland their home. They make it a better place in which to live and work. It strikes me as a no-brainer, Madam Deputy Speaker, that we give, um, that we give EU nationals the certainty they deserve. And on that point, I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman. The Honourable Member for North East Fife is making a, a very cogent and well-structured argument. And broadly, I agree with many of the points he's making. But would he not agree that this is really a Mexican standoff with water pistols? There is no hope. There is no realistic chance that any signatory of the European Convention on Human Rights, of which the United Kingdom is one, in fact we drafted so much of it, is going to kick out anybody from the United Kingdom, and nor are European Union citizens in other parts, or UK citizens rather, in other parts of the European Union, going to be expelled. So wouldn't it be better for this House to recognise the reality that actually their position is not at risk, is not in danger, and wouldn't we be much better off comforting those who are in doubt, rather than spreading fear. Yeah. Uh, the honourable member makes my point for me. Yeah. I mean, first of all, the ECHR is under threat from his very government, and therefore, as being under threat from his very government, does it not make sense to come into the lobbies with them? And I look forward to welcoming yeah. into the lobbies yeah. to support the right of EU nationals to live and work. And I, and I look forward to him standing up for what he's just said there and joining us. And um, if the government is desperately, and I don't know, I'm going to say this to him because he's probably got a lot more influence on those benches than I do, and that's one thing that I will give him. But the government is desperately in need of friends and desperately in need of goodwill. Now, if we benefit financially from EU nationals being here, if our society is richer for EU nationals being here, we want to keep them regardless. These are not bargaining chips, and that is something that the government seems to go down. If EU nationals are not bargaining chips, if they are not bargaining chips, then I would encourage the member to join us in the lobbies and give them the certainty that they need and that they well, deserve. Friend, and on the final point, I will give way to my honourable friend. The situation is made even worse. Accepting what the honourable member said in the bench is opposite. To pick, for example, the EU national in my constituency, Elkie Weston, effectively pit her against my friend in the Netherlands, Tracy de Jong Eglin, does not in any way give them succour. It makes their situations worse in both the Netherlands and in the UK. And the the, the, the Honourable Member for Kirkcaldy makes an excellent point, and um, I, I, I'm not surprised given the amount of work that he's done for EU nationals in his constituency, some very, very hard work. Now, if members of that House are so confident in the ECHR, which they now promise us after telling us it would be the case, that, that, that he says that if, if, if he's so confident in the ECHR, then I look forward to him voting against his own government. However, I don't trust them entirely, and I look forward to the honourable member joining us. If there is not a problem under the ECHR, the honourable member and his colleagues will have absolutely no problem whatsoever with joining us in the voting lobbies. If I can just move on to, we'll be debating the points around the devolved process in the next tranche. But let me just say this in terms of scrutiny. All of this will have an impact on the devolution process, be it in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. If ministers respect the devolution process, then they should have no problem with the additional scrutiny that comes with it. Yep. Right now, we are in a situation where the unelected House of Lords will have a greater say on this process than the elected Scottish Parliament and other devolved legislators. No government, regardless of its colour, has a monopoly on wisdom. The whole point in having a parliament is that we have the scrutiny, the courage of our convictions, and this place has a contribution. If this government is confident in what it is doing, if this government knows what it is doing and, frankly, has any kind of a plan, it should welcome that scrutiny, because fundamentally the scrutiny in the chamber here and in elsewhere in these islands will provide better legislation. On something that is of such enormity that we are about to undertake, they have a responsibility for this to be scrutinised as far as they can. 
Do not underestimate the impact of the decision that we are about to make this week. It will impact on our rights. It will impact on our economy. It will impact on each and every one of us. We will strengthen anything that, um, that encourages scrutiny over this process. The government's record so far has not been a good one. I'm not heartened by what I've seen so far in terms of a white paper that was rushed out and couldn't even get its facts right. And therefore, we owe a debt of responsibility to people across the UK and indeed beyond to, um, to, to have more scrutiny than we are promised and more scrutiny than we have at present. And I beg to move those amendments. But, Order. Before I call the next, uh, the next colleague to speak, it will be obvious to the House that a great many people wish to speak this afternoon. There are in excess of 50 new clauses and amendments to be discussed, and we have two hours and 45 minutes left to do that. Um, I hope that members will be courteous to other members and keep their remarks as brief as possible. I appreciate that these are complicated matters and it's good to have interventions and it's good to have proper debate and discussion, but let's avoid repetition and rhetoric for its own sake. I know I can rely on <laughs> Sir Never. Oh oh point of order, Mr Clark. Following on the point you make, it, I, I, I agree with you, uh, Madam Chairman, it's quite obvious that the timetable motion we have is not going to allow proper debate by the vast majority of members of the House. I've, I've never known a debate on any European issue be given such limited time before. Has anyone approached you and asked to readdress the timetable motion on the business of the House so that we can have the sort of sensible, protracted discussion of these issues that we've had almost to excess on previous occasions, such as the Maastricht Treaty? Well, I can, uh, I can just before I take the, well, let me take the further point of order first. It was further to that point of order from my right hon. Friend. It seemed to me when I was considering the government's programme motion that for a two-clause bill, two days extraordinarily on second reading, and three full days of protected time to allow us to sit late where there are statements, seemed, if anything, an excess of generosity. The um, order, order, the former chief whip makes a very good point, not a point of order for the chair, but one that I would expect a former chief whip to make. Um, let me set the right hon. Gentleman's mind at rest on two points. The first is that although there are uh, in excess of 50 amendments and new clauses, some of them address the same points as others. So we are not addressing more than 50 separate points of debate. And the other point which I would, of course, draw to the honourable gent right hon. Gentleman's attention is that the House has voted for and supported the programme motion, and it's not a matter for me. But I'm sure that I can rely on Sir Hugo Swire to address the House briefly and pertinently. I shall not, uh, I shall seek not to detain the House too long to repeat many of the arguments that uh, <laughs> honourable friends and colleagues have made and will no doubt make again and again and again throughout this evening. Uh, but I just wish to uh, talk about uh, the two clauses that we've been, which have dominated proceedings to date. One rather less emotional uh, than the other. The unemotional one I would submit being new clause three, uh, and we have talked about the parliamentary oversight of negotiations. We've heard the word scrutiny banded around uh, across the chamber this afternoon, and I sometimes get the impression that really there are some uh, in this chamber who would seek to scrutinise every single line uh, cross every T, dot every I of the government's negotiating position. And it would be interesting to do a straw poll, Madam Chairman, as to how many uh, of members in this House have ever actually taken part in a proper negotiation, a commercial negotiation, one which requires uh, at times uh, one to keep one's cards close uh, to hand before declaring them. It is simply impossible, uh, irresponsible and unthinkable to have to negotiate in public, particularly inserting clauses so that anything discussed effectively has to be reported back to this House, not every two months, at intervals of no more than two months. 
no more than eight weeks each and every time. And what he doesn't say uh, is what then Parliament might actually do if they don't like what the government is reporting back. Do they want to vote on it? Uh, we've heard about the possibility of uh, the legal involvement, judicial review. I think it's wholly uh, unrealistic and, and undesir undesirable. Uh, clause 6, or subsection 6, make arrangements for parliamentary scrutiny of confidential documents. I've already alluded to that. Uh, there are ways in this House where privy councillors and so forth can see sensitive information. The thought that the whole House would be able to examine and scrutinise confidential documents without those confidential documents leaking pretty quickly uh, on Twitter or Facebook or into the national newspapers it is, again, wholly uh, unrealistic. How can you possibly, how can you possibly conduct any sort of negotiation, particularly as difficult and as sensitive uh, as these negotiations are set to be, uh, in the glare of publicity, revealing to each and every one of members of this House, and no doubt there will be calls to do the same for the devolved administrations of confidential documents. I think uh, that would be completely uh, crazy. A new clause uh, 6, on the other hand, I do have considerably sympathy, considerable sympathy with those who have spoken about the uncertainty uh, surrounding the status of EU nationals in this country as these negotiations begin. It is uh, unsettling for a lot of these people. It is true that they do contribute enormously to society, uh, to our public uh, sector, health sector, indeed to our agricultural, uh, our agricultural businesses and so forth. We actually need them here and I do have considerably, considerable sympathy with their predicament. However, indeed, I give way. I right, old friend, for giving way. I agree with him entirely. We need to sort this out very early on. Indeed, our right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister, said precisely that only a short while ago. Does he not agree with me that part of the issue is the unwillingness of some of our interlocutors to engage in meaningful discussion prior to the triggering of Article 50? And this is surely a matter that can be dealt with early on, but it requires them to engage immediately and not delay until after Article 50. I, I do agree with that, because it cuts both ways. I think it's uh, cheap politicking to talk about bargaining chips. I don't think anyone's talking about bargaining chips, but I think it does require uh, an early resolution. And I was heartened by my, what my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, said earlier today, that this was something she intended to address early, but it has to be a negotiation between them uh, and us. It is as, as, as important uh, to us, as British parliamentarians, as the British government, to defend the rights of, of British citizens living overseas. And there are a lot of them, and not all of them are contributing particularly to the society there, and a lot of them are retired. So they are even more vulnerable, in a sense, than many of those EU workers who are here actively working. It is the first duty of this House to look after British citizens, wherever they may be, but also making, being aware that we have a duty to EU nationals at the same time. So I think, again, it would be completely wrong in terms of negotiating, in terms of our negotiating position, to declare unilaterally that all EU nationals, up to a certain date, can continue to live here without any fear or favour. Uh, I think that would be unwise. Until and until such a time as we can extract a similar agreement from the other countries of the EU where British nationals have lived sometimes for many, uh, many years. Of course I give way to my right hon. Friend. I am grateful to my hon. Friend. I am delighted to hear him agree in ringing terms what everybody has said so far, that there is absolutely nobody in this House who wishes to cast any doubt on the right of EU nationals to continue living lawfully here if they are lawfully here now. Apparently, the only reason for him holding back, despite the fact he shares sentiments of members opposite absolutely entirely, is he fears there is some unknown European country who, if we declare that a Pole who has been living here for years can stay here, 
<laughs> We've thrown away our card, and British nationals will be expelled by that government. I've heard nobody suggest that any such country exists. We have a pedantic problem about whether we can raise it before the process has started. If we just cleared the position of our EU nationals now, it would put the utmost pressure on every other country to clarify the thing as well. No one is going to take any reprisals against our British nationals. Well, I, I, I hope my right honourable friend is right. He hasn't always been right about everything. He's been right about uh, quite a lot. And he and I were on the same side during this debate. And he, like I, would very much regret all the discussions about migration and immigration, indeed some rather irresponsible points being made repeatedly during the whole Brexit uh, debate about who would be able to come here from the Commonwealth when there was absolutely no such suggestion that this was behind anyone's thinking. But I fundamentally disagree with my right honourable friend. I do not think that we should do anything unilateral before we get an agreement about the rights of British nationals living in the rest of the EU. I give way. I'm most grateful to my right honourable friend. Uh, would he not agree with me that if the matter was as simple as is made out of us just making a simple declaration, why isn't it that the European Union and the other 27 countries don't say that our citizens who are living overseas will be fine and that they will have no repercussions then? They won't make that commitment, so that says something, doesn't it? Well, it may uh, or it may not, and as my right honourable fr and learned friend uh, just said there's not single, any evidence that a single country would uh, not behave in a good way. But there's absolutely no evidence that they all will behave in a good way. We simply don't know because we have not yet had that conversation. And until we have that conversation, until we have that debate, and until we secure that agreement, we should not uh, move to allow every single person in the EU to continue to live here until we've secured similar rights for British citizens living in other EU countries. Thank you very much for giving way. If, if the cynics in us believe that that genuinely could be the case and there could be countries out there who are not prepared to do this, shouldn't we now more than ever lead by example? Well, I don't know if the Honourable Lady was here earlier, but the, the Prime Minister was asked about this earlier and she gave a very strong uh, suggestion that this was at the top of her negotiating uh, priority to secure such a deal. But at the end of the day, it's an agreement, it's a deal, and it has to be negotiated. And I do not think that we would be right to unilaterally declare anything. Doesn't he think that a unilateral declaration would actually do, undo some of the damage that was done by that list of foreign workers stuff that came out of Tory conference in Birmingham, which actually shocked a lot of our European yeah, partners yeah, and actually yeah. hardened their views yeah. against us. If we had a unilateral declaration, surely that might help. Yeah. I, do, I agree with the Right Honourable Ladies. I do think language and sensitivity is incredibly important. Now, these are, we are dealing with uh, families here who are married to EU nationals, EU citizens. We are dealing with people who live here, people who don't know if they've got a future here. This is why we have to resolve it very early on, and I have considerably sim considerable sympathy, as I said early on, with many people who have spoken on this about the contribution that EU nationals make. And I very much hope, I very much hope that we can reach an agreement which will satisfy all those who are here. But equally, I do think our first duty is to look after our citizens abroad. Yes, I give way. I thank the honourable member for giving way, and he's talked about uh, the, uh, the issues that. Um, citizens, British citizens face as well where their partners are <coughs> EU nationals but will he also agree with me about children children who in my constituency I've seen raise real concerns about whether or not they're going to be studying in the same school, where will their future be they don't know the country that their parents may have come from, they are British in every sense of the word and this is giving huge uncertainty we can do this and we can do this this week yeah. Well, We can all, we, we, we can all uh, cite examples at our surgeries, about individual cases, and I'm not sure that actually contributes to the greater argument. What we need to get is a policy in place which covers all this, and that policy can only be achieved by the Prime Minister making it a priority, as she suggested she would do, and getting an agreement from the other member states that actually this is something that continue with the reciprocity that we need for our British people abroad. I give way. I thank my right honourable friend for giving way. Um, he's absolutely right to be concerned about the fate of British citizens living in the European Union. But would you agree with me? I have a couple who've been in my, of my constituents who've been married, living together in this country for 30 years. I consider his wife to be as British as anybody else. And, and what I would say is I absolutely agree with others who said that surely a goodwill gesture 
would be a really positive thing for this government to make, because I believe it's inconceivable for this couple to be separated and for their children to be left with their parents separated, and we should make that absolutely clear. Well, indeed, no doubt uh, there are similar samples from British people in not dissimilar situations living in Spain or in France and elsewhere. We need to ensure that their rights are recognised as well. Uh, Madam Chairman, I am not going to continue uh, in this vein because there are others who wish to come in. Uh, I have made my point. I have sympathy. I think EU nationals contribute a lot to the economy. I hope that there is an early agreement that they can stay and continue to work here. Equally, any such agreement, to my way of thinking, has to be part of a wider agreement ensuring the future of British nationals living in other EU countries. Hillary Mann. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Mrs Lang, I write to, uh, rise to support new clauses uh, 3 and 57 and would commend the speeches made by my honourable friend, the member for Greenwich and Woolwich, and my right honourable friend, the member for Camberwell and Peckham. And the one thing I would say, to add to the forceful case that she put, when we had evidence before the select committee from uh, people representing Brits living abroad, one might have expected them to make the argument we've just heard advanced. But actually, they said the opposite. They said, yes, Britain should give a unilateral commitment now because they felt it would ease the process of negotiation. Right. Now, I, I want to... Fo I will give way, of course. Just on that, I'm, I'm really, because I wasn't at that committee, I'm quite interested, uh, Madam Chairman. Was there evidence taken from the ambassadors from EU countries about their government's positions as part of your inquiry? Uh, no, we have not taken evidence uh, from ambassadors, but we've heard what has been said from that dispatch box. I think from memory, uh, almost all of the member states are up for this, apart from one or two. Now, we don't yet know who the one or two are, and I hope they will change their mind so that we can make progress on this. But I wanted to address the arguments we've heard thus far in relation to new Clause 3. Could I just say to the uh, Honourable Member for Forest of Dean, on his answer to my Honourable Friend of the Member for Lewisham East, no longer in her place, when she said, should we be able to have a vote on certain aspects of the nature of our withdrawal, he said no, because during the course of the referendum campaign, it was made clear by leading participants that this is what would happen if we voted to leave. And therefore, it's gospel, we can't argue with it. Well, I would just say that's a very interesting argument, because on that basis, the NHS will be getting £350 million a week, uh, because that's what was said would be a consequence of a leave vote. But anyway, I leave that on one side. The central argument that the Honourable Gentleman made at the beginning of his speech was to get up and say, what does this add, New Clause 3? And I say to him, genuinely, it adds accountability. That is what new Clause 3 is about. Yeah, yeah. And insofar as it's been argued, well, it's unnecessary because we're doing it already. Well, if we're doing it already, then why is there a problem about the government accepting it? Then the argument was made that the government will be required to, f to be forced to reveal all sorts of stuff. All it says is, shall giving an undertaking to lay before each House of Parliament periodic reports. The content of those reports will be for the government to determine. There's nothing in here about forcing the government to reveal uh, its uh, hand. And when it comes to getting in English the documents which the European Commission is giving to the European Parliament in probably English, since while well, we still have MEPs and the other official languages of the European <laughs> Union, Surely there cannot be any argument about that at all. It is entirely sensible. And on the point about confidential documents, and I listened carefully to what he said and the uh, Honourable Member for, for Stone, I did raise this with the Secretary of State when I was first elected as the Chair of the Select Committee, and he replied to me in a letter and said, and I quote, Negotiations will be fast-moving and will often cover sensitive material, so we will need to find the right ways of engaging Parliament. And I welcomed that reply. And all this says is the government shall make arrangements for parliamentary scrutiny of confidential documents, the arrangement ways for the government to propose. Now, I can't help uh, making the point that it may be the arrangements, given the extent to which Brussels is a very leaky place, and when you're negotiating with 27 other member states, I suspect we'll find out very shortly after the meeting has concluded where the negotiations have got to. The government's arrangements will be to advise us all to buy certain newspapers in which one can read what has been discussed during the course of the afternoon and the evening. Of course I will give way. I'm most grateful. Um, the main point I was making, and I stand by it, is this. 
that new clause 3 imposes a legal obligation enforceable by judicial review on the Prime Minister effectively, not effectively, but actually and legally to break the confidentiality which is imposed, for example, by these limited documents. And I'm quite sure that although, as I've said, I don't subscribe to the degrees of confidentiality sometimes, but that's a personal view, the fact is that it is there and it is a legal obligation. Well, I, I would say t to the uh, uh, Honourable Gentleman, who has great, great experience in these matters, we know that the Commission, in respect of trade negotiations, made arrangements with the European Parliament for uh, certain documents to be made available, including in rooms that people could go and read but couldn't take them away. What this clause is saying to the government, find a way of making it work, which is consistent. Of course, it will have to be consistent with any legal obligations that there are, but it doesn't seem to me a very strong argument, nor does the argument, well, it, it would make it all justiciable. Well, frankly, on that basis, we might as well all go home tonight and never come back, because Parliament legislates, and when Parliament legislate, people can go to the courts and seek to suggest that the way the legislation is being implemented is not correct. So that is not an argument against new clause through. It's an argument against Parliament doing its job. And I would gently say to the government, and having listened to the speeches that have been made from that side, I would say to the Minister, who is a reasonable man, I hope we won't hear him get up and repeat the arguments that we've heard in relation to new clause three, because, frankly, it's really simple and sensible stuff yep. to help Parliament to do its job. And on the frequency of reporting, as he will know, the Secretary of State, when my uh, right honourable friend and a learned friend, uh, the member for um, Hobart and St Pancras, suggested two months, the Minister, the Secretary of State, got up and said, well, that might be a rather modest objective. If it's a modest objective, I really don't see how the Government can oppose it. Yeah. Albert O'Costa. Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. I don't propose uh, to speak for, for more than a few minutes. Mr Chairman, I've been wrestling with this matter for months, and in particular over the course of this weekend. This is a matter that affects not just my constituents in South Leicestershire, many of whom have come to see me and explained to me the problems, for example, as has been mentioned by other members, about children at school. I remember the 1970s being the son of Italian immigrants in Glasgow. And I remember what it felt to be like uh, the only son of, uh, of an immigrant in a classroom full of Scottish people. And I don't want any EU national child across the United Kingdom uh, feeling the way that I felt at times in school in the 1970s. But there is more than simply anecdotal evidence that the situation that has now been caused because of Brexit that it is affecting the well-being of families. Concerns have been raised by the member for Rushcliffe, with which a fellow East Midlands Member of Parliament, who I have nothing but the utmost respect for. And EU nationals, as I have argued with colleagues in here, and we should be saying it far more loudly, have contributed, like my parents over 50 years, an enormous amount to the success and well-being of our United Kingdom. And I want to hear members saying that daily, daily, because those three million plus people, people who have integrated, people who come from every one of the member states, it's often been said during the EU referendum that perhaps there was a cost consequence to having them. I always believed that that was utter rubbish. We've benefited as a country by having immigrants come into the United Kingdom. And the fact is we will continue to benefit because when all of this is over, we will still continue to have EU migrants coming into this country. The difference will be that it will be this parliament and a government, whether Conservative, Labour or otherwise, that will determine the immigration rules. Yeah. But I cannot possibly foresee a situation where a competent British government would attempt to reduce yeah. the levels of immigration that would damage our economy. Which leads me to the point made by a, a, an honourable friend of mine in a newspaper recently about a promise made in the Conservative manifesto, which we did not keep and cannot keep 
We cannot get immigration down to the tens of thousands without damaging our economy. Mr Chairman, however, I have decided to vote against the amendment. And as I said at the outset, I wrestled with this decision because it affects my family personally. And I'll explain why I've decided to do this. I've decided to do this because ultimately the deal that will be reached with the EU will not be uh, wholly legal. It will be political. It will be about personalities. It will be about how the Prime Minister and her team get on with the other side. Now, had I been Prime Minister in July of last year, I may well have taken a different decision. But today, I made a comment to the Prime Minister, and I made it very clear that I am putting my entire trust in her and her ministers to honour the promise that they are giving to the country to get an early deal. And I added to my leader of my party that it would be a decisive mark of her negotiating skills and leadership qualities as Prime Minister. I believe she will get a reciprocal deal that benefits citizens from Scotland, from Northern Ireland, from England and from Wales that live in other EU member states, as well as protecting my own family and friends, my own constituents and other EU nationals across the United Kingdom. So, Mr Deputy Chairman, that is why I am voting against this amendment, because it, ultimately it is a political matter. And it is for the Prime Minister to demonstrate her leadership skills, her negotiation skills in getting this right and coming back to this dispatch box within months yeah. of triggering Article 50, within months with this early deal that we can all agree to and thank her for, for the benefit of all our constituents living abroad and the benefit of EU nationals living in our constituents. <laughs> thank you very much. I was just curious, um, does my honourable friend agree with me that, although I, I support her intentions and most definitely her sincerity in achieving this, if that moment doesn't come as soon as she would like, she should review the idea of unilaterally yes. offering EU citizens their rights and just yes. put everybody out of their misery. It's the right thing to do. Yes. I thank my honourable friend, and again I repeat the comments that I made to the Prime Minister. It will be a decisive mark of her negotiating skills and leadership qualities as Prime Minister. She must come back to this dispatch box early on with this deal. Ms. Yes, I will. I am grateful to my honourable friend. I am grateful for the conclusion that he has reached. I think the other thing which the Prime Minister demonstrated when she was Home Secretary is attention to detail. And as I try to set out for the House, this is actually a more complex matter than it appears on first notice. So one of the things she needs to do is not just get the principle right, but she and her ministers and officials need to get the detail right to make sure that his family and others like them have the security, not just now, but don't have any unforeseen consequences in the future. So I think that's the right decision that he's made. Absolutely, and I agree with the, my right honourable friend. But the promise has been made, made of getting an early agreement, notwithstanding the complexities of it. As a lawyer myself, and as a former corporate lawyer, when my clients came to me asking for me to negotiate, I had to offer solutions to problems. If I did not get the deals that my clients wanted, I would not have been uh, used frequently by those very clients. So it will be a mark of our leader, our Prime Minister, to get the early deal that she is promising our country. And that is why I am supporting her this evening. On, yes, I'm happy to take that. I thank him for, for, for giving way. Obviously, he's made a, a personal decision about this. Does he also accept he uses the analogy of being a lawyer about going to negotiate? The Prime Minister could also just settle and give every EU national in our country right now the right to be here without any further delay. There is an alternative attitude here which would also deliver for his client, isn't there? As I mentioned, had I been Prime Minister in July, I might have started the whole process very differently. But I'd like to refer to the comments made by the Right Honourable Member for Camberwell and Peckham, because I entirely agree with her comments about the consequences of not getting an early deal in this. The consequences 
will be a tsunami of litigation against this government. And therefore, politically, there must be an early deal brought to this House. And that's why I'm trusting the Prime Minister to get that early deal. I'd like to turn briefly to the role of Parliament uh, in this matter. I also think that this is a political one for ministers to give very serious consideration to. Because the fact is the European Parliament does have a substantive role in the negotiations that we don't have. Now, some would say that the primary reason for that is that they are representing 27 other nations, whereas we are representing one sovereign country as the British Parliament. But the fact is, if we hear comments coming from the media reporting on what European parliamentarians are being told, of what our ministerial negotiating team are saying in Europe, it would become farcical if our own government does not report back to us. So I do not see a need to enforce them to do this. It will be politically impossible for the government to function responsibly and appropriately without giving us at least the same information that we are going to be receiving from the media, from the European Parliament. So again, it is a matter of politics rather than binding the hands of the governments in, in, a, in a statutory manner that could be justiciable. And that is why I think I am trusting my government to come back to this House with sensible updates, no different from the updates that the European Parliament will be receiving, for us to continue to debate and discuss the matter uh, as it goes on. Yes, of course. I yeah, my, my reference is on the right side of all these arguments, but a very trusting man. You uh, did not realise the, the, the background to all this is when the European Commission started negotiating the EU US TTIP and so on, they took exactly the same line that the government is now taking, that they could not possibly disclose any of things, compromise negotiations or something. The fact is the European Parliament now gets the information because the European Parliament was less trusting. It is made of sterner stuff than this Parliament has so far proved to be, and I don't think that's in accordance with our parliamentary traditions. Well, I, I respect the judgments and comments made by my right hon. Friend. I read his recent article, however, about his, his own thoughts about his own <laughs> first term in Parliament and how he would have dealt with a similar <laughs> matter. And I'll leave it at I that. Understand. I'll leave it at that. But so, what, so in conclusion, uh, um, uh, Mr D Deputy Chairman, I would say that um, I have listened carefully to the very valuable honourable comments made particularly by members of the opposition on this matter. But I am going to be supporting my government and I am going to be holding my government to account in a way that I never see opposition MPs holding their own government to account in Scotland. Chris Leslie. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Mr Howarth. And it is uh, very touching to hear the member for South uh, Leicestershire uh, rightly talking about, in particular, the issues of EU nationals and his hopes and his aspirations that they should uh, be allowed to remain indefinitely, and of course he is right on that. And yet, he betrayed a little bit of um, uh, fear of possibly offending his front bench by going so far as maybe to wanting to enshrine some of those rights uh, onto the face of the bill. And so, I would like to commend uh, my right honourable friend from. Uh, uh, Campbell and Peckham for her new clause on this particular issue. It's very important. Yep. It uh, provides the assurances that many, many tens of, if not hundreds of thousands of people residing in this country uh, require. I tabled a similar new clause, new clause 14, in that regard, and I hope that the House will uh, support it later on. But Mr. Howarth, I think the wider context of this debate really that we're having today, with over 50 substantive amendments on very distinct and specific uh, issues of great importance, is uh, the contrast between the desire of members to raise these issues and the nonsensical four hours in which these uh, questions have to be considered. I think something like about four minutes for each one of the particular topics that we have. And Mr Howarth, I think nothing could demonstrate more clearly to members in the other place, in the House of Lords, 
how important it is that they do the due Absolutely. diligence yeah, yeah, on this yeah. bill that the yeah, House yeah. of Commons is clearly not going to be able right. to do. The, one of the most important pieces of legislation in our time, the EU Withdrawal Bill. Let's just remind ourselves what we're talking about here. Yep. A bill that may, yes, have just a simple clause or two in it, but with phenomenal yeah, ramifications yeah. for Absolutely. all of our constituents. And if we fail, if we fail to address those in proper detail, we're failing in our duty to scrutinise the government in a serious way. I'll give way to my honourable friend. I thank my honourable friend for giving way. Is it not worth noting that when it came to, for example, debating the Treaty on Lisbon or the Treaty on Maastricht, we had 30 days allocated within the House of Commons alone to discuss these issues? Five days is a very poor comparison by return. Yeah. Absolutely. My honourable friend is uh, completely right. This bill is far more important than all of those treaties wrapped uh, together because this is about withdrawing from the European Union. And what makes it worse, Mr Howard, was the white paper that we had from the government. Don't forget, Mr Howard, this came the day after we had the vote on the second reading. Yeah. Pretty shocking and, uh, I think, uh, uh, quite contemptuous of the yeah. uh, rights that the House of Commons should have. Uh, a, a lamentable document because of the lack of information that it contained on so many of the important issues that I've certainly tabled amendments on, and honourable members have done the same. So I think we should be using the time that we have today, Mr Howarth, to talk about uh, what we need to know and ask the government what is their plan. And that is why I just briefly go through some of the new clauses that I've tabled today. Take for sake of argument, uh, Mr Howarth, the first one, new clause 20 on financial services. You could say uh, merely a small corner of Britain's uh, ah. GDP, but it, pro it provides £67 billion of revenue for all of our schools, for all of our hospitals. Absolutely if we right. uh, mess around with that particular sector in the wrong way, we're all going to be poorer and our public services will be poorer as a result. So this new clause, I'll give away in a moment, but yes, certainly to my honourable friend, but um, just on the financial services issues, we're, we, this new clause suggests a report twice a year on where we're going on some of these questions that weren't contained in the white paper. What is our progress towards a smooth transition from existing open market access, where we have those passports, to the new arrangements, whatever they're going to be? The white paper merely says, oh, well, we'd quite like to have the freest possible trade, but doesn't say anything about the sort of mutual cooperation, regulation and oversight, what's going to happen to those issues. Are we going to be able to have permanent equivalence rights for some of those uh, trades? Will UK firms have time to adjust? These are already issues which are presenting a clear and present danger to our economy. HSBC saying a thousand jobs yep. are going to go. Lloyds of London moving some of their activities. Yep. UBS moving a thousand jobs. JP Morgan have said potentially four thousand jobs. These are firms voting with their feet already. And yet the white paper, white paper hardly even touches on this particular question. Yeah. Give to my friend. Uh, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend. Can I pay tribute to him? for the kind of diligence he's put in to this bill to bring forward these very important amendments. But isn't, if you boil all of this down, not necessarily about passporting and all the complicated legal framework around financial services, but it's the tens of thousands of my constituents' jobs who are in highly skilled, yeah. highly paid jobs in the financial services sector who are worried about future employment. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And when honourable members uh, are asked, well, what about financial services? And, and, uh, their constituents say, what time did you have to debate these particular issues? Marriott. Well, it was only about a couple of hours to do it, maybe a few minutes. I didn't say anything about it because of the ridiculous programme motion yeah, that we put in yeah, place yeah, to yeah, curtail yeah, yeah. debate. I, I, I'll give way uh, one last time and then I, I've got a lot to move on to. Thank the Honourable Member for giving way. Is it right that he talks down the City of London in this way? I mean, we all know that all of the threat that has been made, but not one of those jobs has left the City of London. And the fact of the matter is that the choice between London, Frankfurt, Dublin or Paris, those companies will choose London every time. Well, I, I really, really hope that is the case. I absolutely would agree with him on that aspiration. But he should look at the press releases from HSBC exactly. and from Lloyds of London and from UBS and from JP Morgan. These aren't alternative facts, Mr Howarth. Uh, this, is, this is the real <laughs> truth. Yeah, this yeah. Is, these are people's jobs and revenues for our country yeah. that we are potentially yeah. leaving. But very quickly, yes. Sorry. On that very specific point, it is not talking down the, the City of London 
to highlight that the City UK report emphasises the best case scenario from the government's plans is a 7,000 job loss. The worst case scenario could be more than 70,000 job losses. That's not talking the city down, that's making the economic case for ensuring the best deal is secure. No, and, and uh, this, these are the realities we face. I'll give way to my honourable friend briefly. Well, isn't the point that my honourable friend's making is that we are now a service economy? 88% uh, of London is the service sector. The service sector can move. Prior to joining the European Union, uh, we had things in the ground. We were a great manufacturing nation. That is not the case today. <laughs> and, and again, an issue that deserves a massive amount of consideration, but we just don't have the time to go through it today, Mr Howard. Move on, then, to New Clause 22, which is about, about again, a small area of policy, competition policy. So, oh, in the white Major paper, issue. absolutely nothing said at all about what the UK will be doing on our exit from the European Union in respect of competition policy. Totally silent. Are we going to change our attitude towards state aid for industry? What will our state aid rules be? If we change, are our trading partners going to balk at the idea that we might be subsidising products in a particular way? Will yeah. we be undercutting their production? Will we not wish to do that? Um, are we going to take on the WTO disciplines on subsidies? Uh, are we going to join the uh, EEA scheme when it comes to subsidies, state aid rules, competition <laughs> policy, EFTA? This is a really big deal, Mr Howarth. Think of those uh, subjects that have come up recently. Hinkley Point, British Investment Bank, British Steel. All of these are questions we have to make some decisions about and consider. All I'm saying in New Clause 22 is that we should have a report from the government in a month's time on what their attitude is to competition policy, a pretty simple measure. And then, uh, Mr Howarth, I've put down a series of other amendments that would require ministers uh, to set out their aspirations, again, within one month of royal assent, on a series of other questions that rightly come up because we're about to extract ourselves from some of those European partnerships and alliances and agencies. Take, Mr Howarth, the issue of law enforcement. We're, what are we going to do in terms of Europol? Um, a new clause 111 uh, talks uh, about uh, the benefits that we get currently from the cross-border uh, cooperation when it comes to cybercrime, when it comes to terrorist activities, combating trafficking. All of these are really important activities that go on. We deserve the right to know what the government's approach is going to be when it comes to cross-border border crime, as we do with the European Police College, with Eurojust when it comes to the our cooperation with prosecuting authorities when it comes to the European Monitoring Centre for Drugs and Drug Addiction, also the European Agency on Fundamental Human Rights as well. All issues upon which the White Paper is totally silent. The idea that we, we know what the government's plan is, its negotiating stance, absolutely we do not. And yet we don't have the time to debate it substantively. I'll give way to my honourable friend first. I thank, I thank my honourable friend for giving way. I don't know what the government's worried about because anybody knows that knows about negotiations. You report back from time to time. You don't necessarily give away your negotiating hand. I don't know what they're scared of. Well, I, I think it's, it, they may well be scared of the debate. I think it's also a fact. Uh, that reflects uh, their, their lack of awareness about what in, indeed they're going to have to be engaging with here. I just don't think the government have thought this through. I, don't th I think they're confronting issues as they bubble up uh, on a fairly random level. Uh, they give the veneer of control, don't uh, show what's on our cards, um, I can't give a running commentary. These are all phrases used by ministers when uh, actually uh, behind the curtain they're panicking and their feet are moving quite rapidly because they really haven't got a clue. Yes, I'll give away. But by logical extension, uh, the honourable gentleman is saying that he wants to unpick almost every single part of uh, EU policy and legislation and cooperation with the UK and bring it to this House and get the government to set out what it wants to do about it. How, how long does he think it would take to actually uh, disassociate ourselves from the EU? Two years or, or, or 20 years if we were to go down that line? Well, 
it would take more than the three days that he and his honourable friends have given to debate these particular questions. But we're leaving the European Union. We're withdrawing. That's what this legislation is for. He, he and his honourable friends may well be uh, happy to just simply no. trust the Prime Minister entirely in all uh, matters related to these things. But Parliament is sovereign. The Supreme Court gave us this duty. They said that we should do our due diligence of these particular questions, but the time constraints will, will prevent us from doing it. If I just might ra raise a couple of other questions on law enforcement issues. The big one, I think, in New Clause 177, is what the government's policy will be in respect of the European arrest warrant. Yeah. Now, the European arrest warrant, of course, is there to make sure that we can transfer criminal suspects or sentenced uh, persons uh, so we can put them on trial and vice versa in other countries. The UK extradited over 8,000 individuals accused of or convicted of criminal offences to the rest of the UK. Think of that case of uh, Hussein Osman, found guilty of the Shepherd's Bush uh, tube bombings in July 2005, only captured in Rome and extradited because of the European <coughs> arrest warrant. He got 40 years sentence as a result of these things. The Prime Minister herself said that ditching the European arrest warrant would lead Britain to becoming, quote, a honeypot for all of Europe's criminals on the run from justice. That was in 2014, from the Prime Minister's own mouth. But what will be our attitude towards the current level of participation? Will we want to continue with the European arrest warrant? Nothing in that white paper about this particular issue. Yes, I'll give one. Well, gentlemen, for giving way, but is it not the agencies that are going to be the biggest problem? The government describes moving everything over with a great repeal bill, but if the great repeal bill refers to actions that depend on an EU agency, we don't have that agency. And, that, and that, that's the fallacy of uh, honourable members being reassured. Um, don't worry, we can come to this in later legislation. It'll all be fine. The Great Repeal Bill will be able to deal with these things. Because, of course, it won't. These are facilities, these are levels of cooperation and alliances that exist because of our membership of the European Union. And yet we're not even going to have the time to debate and discuss the consequences of these things. Mr Howarth, I'd better move on pretty rapidly. Public health issues. What's the plan? What are the government intending to do? The White Paper, again, said virtually nothing about a whole range of critical alliances. Disease control, the European Centre for Disease yeah. Prevention and Control, New Clause 113. We had that outbreak of SARS in 2003, rapidly spreading across all sorts of countries. We had the help, because of these EU-wide institutions there, to provide research and intelligence for public health authorities, what we were going to do. No answer in the White Paper about the British Government's attitude when it comes to that sort of um, pan-European uh, question. What are we going to do about the Medicines Agency, mm -hmm. New Clause 115, <coughs> currently based in London? harmonises the work of national uh, medica medicine regulatory bodies, I'll give way in a moment, um, across a whole range of issues to do with uh, the application for marketing authorisation, support for medicine development, patents, uh, monitoring safety of medicines, providing medical information to healthcare professionals and so forth. Who is going to take on this responsibility? What is going to happen? The White Paper was totally silent on this question. I'll give away. Well, I can tell my honourable friend that the Health Secretary told the Health Committee uh, the other day that he'd already thrown in the towel on the European oh. Medicines Agency. Not only are we giving it up, we're leaving it, we're giving up the headquarters, hundreds of jobs in <gasps> London. That will mean far slower uh, approval of this. vital drugs in this Shocking. country and the loss of all, all, all our influence and all those jobs. Yes, and, and again, no sense of uh, strategic alternative from the government, and no idea about what their plan is going to be. I'll give way to my honourable friend. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend. Given that the government have said that they're pulling out of um, Euratom because it is part of the EU, isn't the logical extension of their position to pull out of all of all these agencies? agencies? Yeah. Yeah. And if that's right, why does he think they don't want to face up to that? Is it because they don't want to face up to the costs of duplicating the work of 30-odd agencies? Yeah. Well, I think, I, I, first of all, I don't think ministers really know what they're going to do about some of these questions. They're hoping that it's 
fairly sort of low level, nobody will particularly spot it, it's very specialist, you know. But actually, uh, Mr. Howarth, these are questions that will start to affect very many people, yep. and there are a myriad of issues that will go through. I'll, I'll give away to my friend, but I'm not, I've got to move on. I'm very thankful for my honourable friend giving way. Um, talking about European Medical Agency, is he aware that because of the move of the getting out of that, many jobs in the medical world, in the, in the drugs world, will move out of Britain. I met with people representing, the, representing those interests only today. They are very fearful of what will happen to British jobs. And, and, and I'm afraid to say to my honourable friend, not only is he right, but the list goes on of the consequences of withdrawing from the EU without Parliament even having the opportunity to properly debate it. Food safety, the European Food Safety Authority. So we're going to be throwing in the towel uh, on uh, the independent scientific advice on food chain issues and research that we currently have through our involvement in food safety. Nothing in the white paper. What about that E111 health insurance scheme? Yep. Yep. Honourable members will remember that. It's not just for tourists. E110 for hauliers, E128 for students. What's the plan? What will happen when our constituents go abroad? And do they, oh, the honourable gentleman knows what the plan is, the E111. <laughs> The right honourable gentleman, if he read of it, would understand it as perfectly well as I do. The plan is very simple. All existing laws and requirements will be transferred into good British law. If we need a different adjudicator, an adjudicator will be selected and approved by Parliament. And the great news for both him and me is that nothing will change legally unless and until this Parliament debates it and wants to change it. Well, I, I, I don't know whether the right honourable gentleman has actually left these shores and visited other countries, but we don't control the sort of health insurance and health service schemes that happen in those other European countries. But we do currently have a reciprocal health insurance arrangement that provides him and his family and his constituents with a, a certain degree of cover. But uh, that could well be ripped up because of the consequences of the legislation we are, we are potentially passing today, and not a word from the government, nothing in the white paper. I'll give away. I thank Lord Friend for giving way. The point he's making about the E111 scheme is, is, is very important. Because it's a practical impact for constituents. If we don't have an answer on that, I fear many constituents will be forced into buy, buying very expensive travel insurance policies to make sh absolutely sure that they are covered um, while this is left in limbo. The consequences of this and other aspects are myriad, and I hope that the House will begin to wake up and realise that we've been sold a pup with this programme motion. We can't even have time to discuss this. No. I, I have to move on, Mr uh, Howard, because the European Chemicals Agency is something we're also going to be ditching. Um, companies currently have to provide information about hazards, risks, safe use of chemicals. We're going to be potentially leaving that. Nothing in the white paper about the alternative. Another issue to do with health and safety, aviation. Yep. What are we doing in terms of the safe skies? Oh, what are we doing in terms of industries. the regulation of aircraft parts and engines oh, and all of these other that, aspects? That, that what are we doing in terms of maritime safety, yeah. shipping? What happens if there are shipping disasters that go on on or around our shores? What is the government's alternative? Yeah. Nothing in the white paper. When it comes to another minor issue, he said sarcastically, the environment. We're going to be potentially leaving the European Environment Agency as well. New Clause 120 simply asks that we have a report within a month on what the government's plan should be. I'd like to move on, if I, if I may. On, when it comes to education, science and research issues, we're going to be leaving potentially the European Research Agency, which of course is very important. Honourable members may know about the Erasmus scheme. I'll give way in a moment. Erasmus stands for the European Regional uh, Region Action Scheme for the Mobility of University Students. So all of our constituents yep. currently who want to go and study abroad for a few months can still have that time recognised as part of their degree. What is going to happen to that scheme? Nothing in the white paper. It doesn't say are our students in our constituencies potentially losing out very significantly. It comes to satellite issues, plant variety Nothing issues, vocational right. training, Nothing all sorts of things. Right. Right. I'll give way first of all to my honourable friend and then I'll... Yes, I will. I thank my honourable friend for giving way. He is indeed making a very excellent speech and highlighting the complexity of these challenges that we face. So he also has made reference to science. And uh, will he agree with me, um, uh, referring to, um, as, uh, I'll refer him to a conversation I had yesterday with Claire in my constituency, a scientist, extremely 
concerned about how our collaboration will work and what projects we may be included in in the future. And secondly, the concerns around what impact this is going to have on young people. Their future is ahead of them, and in a sense, we're taking the rug out from under their feet. Yeah. Yeah. We have the time and the space and the uh, opportunity to, to discuss the consequences for her constituents, but we won't do that. My honourable friend will have to write back to her, tell her we didn't have time in the House of Commons. Yep. Yep. Fingers crossed the House of Lords yeah. will do some yeah. of this work and ask ministers uh, in the other place. Yes, I'll give way. I thank my honourable friend for giving way. He is doing an excellent job yeah. trying to scrutinise the implications of this bill with far too little time. We've got less time on the floor of this House than we would in committees on much less important bills. Does he agree with me that whilst we may want all of these issues sorted out within two years, this may not happen, which is why we both must have transitional arrangements as well as a vote on the final deal so that this House can see if the government has done its job properly and truly got the best deal. Yeah. Well, exactly, and we need to use that two-year negotiation period wisely and we'll come, I think, tomorrow in committee, Mr Howarth, to some of those particular issues. I ought to give way to the Honourable Lady. I'm grateful to him for giving way. Would he agree that, as well as the issue of the environment policy, what we need to do is make sure that it's enforceable, because there's not any good just moving it across if you can't bring the enforcement to bear? And would he also agree with me that the investment bank, the European investment bank, crucial issue, massive investor in renewable energy in this country. We need to know where we stand in relation to that. Yes, I'll move on then to, to new clause 122, oh, well, Mr Howarth. Really in, in a moment, I'll give what because that does reference the European Investment yes. Bank. A whole series of economic and trade cooperation issues, again, not referenced at all in the White Paper. Can you imagine, Mr Howard, the government producing a White Paper about the consequences of withdrawing from the European Union and not even mentioning the European Investment Bank, which currently, by the way, we have a 16% stake in. It is part funding Crossrail. It's part funding the Manchester Metro Link. These, this is a, a massively important institution, and we're just sort of, in a blasé way, shrugging and saying, trust the Prime Minister, it will all be fine. We should at least ask ministers, what is the attitude of the British government? And I ask the minister directly, what is the attitude of the British government to our continued participation in the European Investment Bank? He needs to address this and other issues. I'd better move on, because I just wanted to talk about a couple of other new clauses that we have. I know honourable members want to get in, and it's frustrating that we don't have the time to but I'm glad to see I'm glad to see a couple of honourable members in their place who might be interested in these things because new clauses 128, 129, and 30 deal with that issue of the protected designation of origin yeah. of goods and services, the protected geographic indication. Now, honourable members may well have businesses within their constituencies. I look, for example, at the honourable member for, well, actually, Stilton, this is sometimes known as the Stilton Amendment. I understand that Stilton isn't necessarily made in northwest Cambridgeshire, but he has the village of uh, Stilton within his boundaries. The honourable uh, lady for Truro and Falmouth uh, is uh, well aware of the wonders of foul oysters. They are protected due oh. under the um, uh, PGI scheme uh, uh, for, as a European uh, trade. These are, I'll give away in, in a moment, Tim. Whether it's the Stilton Amendment or the Scotch Whiskey Amendment, uh, 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 Mr. Uh, 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 Howarth, these, these new clauses simply ask what is the government's plan? when these protected products, much cherished, much valued, not just where they are produced, but also where they are consumed worldwide, might lose their protected status. So we end up with um, potentially knock-off Scotch whiskey Absolutely. being sold around the world without the protection of those things. Scotch beef, Welsh lamb, Melton Mowbray pork pies, Arbroath Smokies, Yorkshire Wensleydale, Newcastle Brown Ale, the Cornish pasty. I'll give way to the Honourable General. I'm most grateful to the Honourable General for giving way, and he has indeed been very generous. As it happens, the protected status of the Stilton cheese prohibits people living in the village of Stilton in my constituency who have researched the cheese and found that it was originally made in the village and they cannot make Stilton cheese because they are prohibited from doing so because of the protected status that he refers to. And when we leave the European Union, they will be able to make Stilton cheese in Stilton. <laughs> We get 
some, some sign of life from the other side. They're finally interested in the consequences of withdrawing from the European Union. It, it, I mean, it, it, it is an issue that the House really should have the opportunity to discuss, because there are many firms and industries and producers on either side of this question who will uh, either benefit or probably lose out as a result of our exiting from the European Union in that way. Yes. Um, I thank my honourable uh, friend for giving way, and blessed are the cheesemakers wherever they happen to live. Um, but I wanted to uh, say, go back to his uh, new clause on the chemicals agency, new clause 112, and alert him to the fact that the Environment and Audit Committee is looking into this. I have the 200 pages of evidence, Chair, sorry. Um, I have the 200 pages of evidence into what leaving the European chemicals regulations will mean for the motor industry, the defence industry and the pharmaceuticals industry in this country, and it does not make for pretty reading. Uh, and, and these are really serious questions about hazards that could affect our constituents, um, substances that are, do provide certain dangers, uh, can be carcinogenic in many ways, as my honourable friend says. But um, it's, it's the sense of disappointment that we have with the government, yes, in their white paper, but also by trying to gag Parliament's ability yep, to debate absolutely. these particular issues, by Hard trying to muzzle honourable members from across the House from being able to cover some of these questions, we're going to end up uh, far poorer and far worse off. And actually what it does is it sends a message to uh, the noble lords in the other place that they will have to do the job yeah, of yeah, scrutiny yeah, and due yeah, diligence yeah, yeah. that we it's were unable to, to do. This is our only substantive opportunity, Mr Howard, to debate the EU withdrawal bill. And Parliament does deserve more respect uh, than the government have shown uh, with this uh, in, uh, substantial and inadequate uh, white paper, which doesn't touch on very many of the questions that we have uh, in these sets of new clause. We simply wanted to know what are they going to do, what is their plan, and in the response to this debate, I sincerely hope the Minister will tell us. Yeah. Yeah. Heidi Allen. Very much, Mr Chairman. I rise to speak briefly on Amendments 171 and 173, but principally Amendment 57. I am proud to represent South Cambridgeshire, which is home to some of the most impressive academic and scientific research in the world. We attract and grow the most innovative brains, and we do this by looking outwards, not inwards. Whilst I know the Government has confirmed that all EU legislation will simply transfer to UK law on the day of exit, I do feel particular attention should be given to planning our future academic and scientific collaborations. Amendments 171 and 173 request reports from Government on the future of the Erasmus Plus scheme and ERA participation. And given that our academic and research industries are two of our greatest exports and feature heavily in the B strategy, such reports should be very straightforward. We need to give clarity and reassurance to these sectors who I know are exceptionally worried about the future. The University of Cambridge, the Babram Institute, the Genome Campus, the Laboratory of Molecular Biology, to mention just a few in my constituency, are so important to national prosperity and they deserve priority in government's thinking. Turning to Amendment 57, on which we all vote on Wednesday. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> She's making a very important speech, and is she also aware that it is not necessary to leave behind all these EU agencies? Yeah. For example, in the area of research and development, Israel belongs to Horizon 2020. Doesn't she think that the government should look into this and think about such a status yeah, for this country yeah. as well? Yeah, I agree entirely, and I think what will be the most important thing is for ministers to listen to organisations like mine in terms of what they need. I am pleased the um, Secretary of State for leaving the EU has visited Cambridge twice, I believe, since Christmas, so clearly he's listening. But you know, we are not the experts in this room, those organisations are, and they need to tell us absolutely right, and we should listen to what they need. Yes, of course. I I'm very grateful to Honourable Lane for giving way. Uh, does she also agree that one of the problems that universities have is that students, PhD students, academics are choosing not to come to Britain yep. now? That's it right. means that our global universities are losing out to Harvard, Yale, Berkeley yeah, and other yeah, countries. Yeah, 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 yeah. I speak regularly to, regularly to the University of Cambridge. I have a couple of their colleges in my constituency. And whilst so far numbers are not down, I know they're very, very worried. Beyond a couple of years, certainly, they have concerns. And it's a fundamental part of you know, what is great about this country, and they deserve our protection, and that's why we need to look fully at the implications for them, and government needs to listen. So if I may, turn to Amendment 57, which is, of course, probably the, one of the most important debates that we will have. 
and that is the continuing rights of EU citizens lawfully residing here before or on the 23rd of June last year. I recognise the Prime Minister has said she will seek reciprocal rights as her earliest negotiation priority, and that in actual fact many EU citizens already have an automatic right to, re to remain. However, this issue will continue to keep many of my constituents awake at night until it is resolved. Probably like the Honourable Lady, I have had a number of my constituents write to me who are married to British citizens, but they are EU nationals and they're very, very concerned about this. And I would have thought the government could give them some sort of comfort because it's certainly creating problems within families. Absolutely, and I, I speak as a, um, a woman with a German mother. I think on some occasions my father would be quite pleased if my mother was sent back. But I, I, do, I do understand. I do understand the rift, and he would agree with me on that. Um, I do understand the rifts this causes in community, particularly in South Cambridge. We are absolutely bursting with EU citizens from every nation in the EU. They have families, they have relatives, and it's not actually just the EU citizens who are worried. It's the communities that wrap around them because they are part of their communities too. Will my honourable friend give way? Yes, of course. I'm, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend for giving way. But isn't this issue actually solved by the government's current proposals that when everything is brought into UK law by the Great Repeal Bill, all EU nationals here will continue to have the right to reside, and they will continue to have that unless Parliament legislated to take it away, which seems to me to be inconceivable. Here, here. <laughs> And my honourable friend, I'm sure, makes a very accurate point. I suppose the point I'm trying to make is, whilst there may be legal and administrative realities as to why people would never be sent home, the perception, the feeling of people, actually, is more important. And we deserve to cut through that red tape for them and make that clarity. I'll give way. People for giving way. Just for context, so that people listening at home can understand and not feel unduly nervous about what's happening, would she agree that 61% of all the EU nationals living in the UK already have permanent right to reside in this country? And by the time the UK does leave, that figure will have risen to somewhere between 80 and 90%. So a very, very large proportion of EU nationals already in this country have absolutely nothing to worry about. There is, of course, a valid point that you make, or my honourable friend makes, but I suppose the point is this shouldn't just be about a piece of paper and whether you've completed it or not. We've already heard occasions where people's um, applications have been turned away. This is not just about citizens who've been five years or ten years. Every day, brains and skills come to my constituency. And should I discriminate against one who's been here two years or five years? No. They have a right to be here, they have a right to be here, and we should honour that for them. Yes. I, I don't know whether my honourable friend was listening to the remarks that I made earlier, but I, I met them very sincerely. There are over 4,000 EU nationals who don't fit the description that my honourable friend's talking about, people who are here and have abused our hospitality by committing crimes for which they've been sent to prison. Now, the problem with a blanket approach is that that will give those people the right to stay here. And I know from having dealt with individual cases, if someone's not entitled to be in the United <coughs> Kingdom, or rather they came here as an EU national and commit a serious crime, nothing will do more damage to the, the views of British people about the welcome that they give to EU nationals if we can't deport serious criminals. Has she given some thought to that? Um, I've noticed in the brief time that I've been in the chair that some of the interventions seem to be getting excessively long. And I should remind uh, people that interventions should be confined to a single point and a short one at that. Heidi Allen. Thank you. And, and Mr Chairman, I'm pleased to know that my speech actually is very short, so I don't have too much more to get through. Um, yes, there is an element of that, that there are... Speeches. Interventions are long, then my speech will be short. <laughs> um, <laughs> just, sorry, returning to my friend, right on friend's point. Yes, there is, there's, nothing's perfect. But should we be making policy based on a few bad apples or the rights of thousands of fabulous citizens who come here and contribute? And what we're talking about today is whether we should be offering unilateral rights to them ahead of securing those for our, our UK citizens abroad. And I have a sense that it's the moral and the right thing to do, that we should be leading the way on this and offering unilaterally those rights to you citizens. And, um, forgive me, I won't, because I wish to just make a little bit of progress, but I'll come back. Until we have that resolution, however and whenever it comes, it will prey on the minds of families, on our NHS, 
and it will damage the collaboration which is vital to the scientific and academic organisations in my constituency. Many of my constituents have lost all sense of direction and they are struggling to recognise the tolerant, open country they are normally so proud of. The wounds of the referendum have not yet healed. And although I was grateful for the opportunity to probe the Prime Minister earlier today in her statement to the House, I would like to repeat my request that a unilateral offer to EU citizens must be kept in her mind. As time passes, I fear the distasteful currency value of both our citizens and EU citizens abroad will increase. And if an early agreement is not reached, as the Prime Minister hopes, I would urge her to step in and halt the trading. We are talking about people. If the Prime Minister were to offer continued rights to EU citizens unilaterally, I believe she would pull the country in behind her. She would strengthen our collective re resolve and push her forward through the negotiations with the shared will of the 48 and the 52 per cent, because at the moment the 48 per cent in my constituency do not feel part of the conversation. And crucially, we would demonstrate that in this global turbulence, Britain is, as it always has been, a beacon for humanity, for democracy, a principled and proud nation, and one day soon, I hope, leading the way with compassion and dignity. Uh, Alistair Carmichael. Uh, I beg to move uh, those uh, new clauses standing in my name and the names of my honourable and right honourable uh, friends, um, we have a quite remarkable range of amendments before us this evening, um, so I will confine my remarks merely to those relating to the position of EU nationals uh, wishing to remain and their right to remain in the European Union. I want to say, Mr Howth, why this matters to me as a Liberal and as an Islander, because when you represent island communities, you understand that very often things have to run to different rules and we have different priorities. One of the most important things in keeping an island community viable and prosperous and growing is maintaining a viable level of population. And in recent years and decades, the contribution of EU citizens to growing and maintaining the services and the businesses within the island communities that it is my privilege to represent has been enormously <coughs> important. It matters to my communities, therefore, that the position of these EU nationals who live in our communities, who contribute to our public services and to our businesses, should be clarified, they should be given the greatest possible reassurance at the earliest possible opportunity. There is no aspect of island life these days in which you will not find EU nationals living and working. They work in our fish houses, they work in our hotels and bars, they work in our hospitals, they work in our garages and our building companies, they teach in our schools. You go into the admirable University of the Highlands and Islands, you find them leading some groundbreaking research there, especially in the development of renewable energy, of a future uh, for our whole country. And that is why uh, the position of these uh, people in our communities matter to the people I represent uh, and they matter to me and they should matter to us all. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I'm grateful to the Right Honourable Gentleman for giving way and for whom I have a huge amount of respect and he's making a very good point uh, as regards the EU nationals. Indeed, many colleagues have said likewise. <coughs> Would he, however, not accept that whilst we talk about securing the position of EU nationals living in Britain, we as British parliamentarians have a duty to British nationals living overseas and that we have a duty to make sure that they too are looked after and that if we secure the rights of foreigners living in this country before they are looked after, we neglect our duty. I, I say uh, gently to the, the honourable gentleman with whom I have worked in the past and, and whom I hold uh, in some regard that it is bluntly invidious to play the group the interests of one group of desperate people off the interests of another group of desperate people. And there is a danger 
of that emerging from what he is saying and the, the terms in which he puts it. Because, in fact, as the Right Honourable Member for Leeds, the Chairman of the Select Committee on Leaving the European Union, on which I also serve, reminded us, this was the evidence that we heard from those who are currently British nationals living in other parts of the European Union. This is what they want us to do, because they see, Mr Howarth, that in fact it is in their interests that we should do this. They see this as being the best, most immediate and speediest way in which their position can be given some degree of certainty. And I think actually the real importance of it is this. It is all about the atmosphere that a move such as this would create. We can't ignore the atmosphere that we have found in many of our communities since the 23rd of June, the spike that we have seen in hate crime. We have to also think, though, about the atmosphere in which the Prime Minister is going to open the uh, negotiations when she does so after the triggering of Article 50. Uh, and the atmosphere would be so much better, it would be so much improved if we were able to say we enter this as a negotiation between friends and neighbours and as such we offer you this important move for your citizens as a mark of our good faith and our good will. Now, I also want to deal though in one one, one, one uh, matter that was being uh, raised in the Select Committee, and it, is, it has been touched on today, and it is the, the opportunity of EU nationals to secure their position by means of the permanent residence card. Now, I say to the Minister on the bench, this is something with which he should be talking to his colleagues in the Home Office about, because there are enormous difficulties with this. I see the Immigration Minister on the bench. He will be aware that some 30 per cent of applications, the expensive applications that are necessary for permanent residence cards, are currently refused. The evidence that was brought to the Select Committee was that this involves, I think, an 85-page forum. The sheer volume of supporting documentation that is required for these applications is enormous. The level of detail that is asked about the occasions on which people <coughs> over the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years have left the country, uh, 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 d d even on, on holiday, and then returned, and the evidence that is required to support these dates is quite unreasonable. It is putting an enormous burden on uh, those who are seeking these, uh, this small measure of reassurance in the short to medium term, and it does require to be revisited. And it, was, it came home to me the unfairness of the situation, Mr Howarth, when I saw a constituent on Friday who brought to my office the letter she received in 1997 from the then Immigration and Nationality Directorate when she was told, and I quote a verbatim, you can now remain indefinitely in the United Kingdom. You do not need permission from a government department to take or to change employment, and you may engage in business or a profession as long as you comply with any general regulations for the business or professional activity. Nobody told my constituent in 1997 that 20 years later she was going to have to produce tickets to show that in 2005 she took a, a two-week holiday in Ibiza or whatever. Exactly. That, though, is a situation in which she now finds herself if she is going to achieve that small measure of security for her and her, her, and her family. Mr Howarth, the challenge that faces our uh, country at this point is how we go forward in a way that allows us to bring the 52 and the 48 per cent back together. This is an enormous challenge for our country. It is one that we cannot meet simply with the support of half of our population. It is something for which we need all our people to be able to pull together. This would be one small measure that would allow the government 
to bring the two sides together to get the best possible deal for all our citizens, whether they are British by birth or British by choice. Bill Quince. Thank you. Uh, Mr Howard, it's a pleasure to follow the uh, honourable member for Orkney and Shetland, although he, he may not entirely um, share the sentiment once I, I finish my contribution. Uh, I, I <laughs> promised Mr Howard it's going to be a short contribution in the interests of time and the number of people that would like to make um, or have their say. I rise to speak against, in particular, new clauses 56 uh, and 134. There are some in this House who have said that the referendum shouldn't be respected because the people didn't know what they were voting for. They are determined to find confusion where none exists. They say that the public voted to leave the European Union, but not the single market or the customs union. Members are arguing with these amendments that we in this House need to debate whether or not we leave the single market. I disagree. The majority of voters who took part in the referendum said they wanted us to leave the European Union. Many of those who contacted me said they wanted to restore our parliamentary sovereignty and indeed over our courts, regain control over our immigration policy, to strike out in the world and forge new deals with countries across the globe. These aims are incompatible with remaining in the single market, or indeed the customs union. We chose to go to the people with this referendum. Mr Howard, I did not campaign for either side in this referendum, but I followed the two campaigns closely. Throughout the referendum campaigns, those who were involved in the Leave campaign said that we would be leaving the single market. On the Remain side, our former Prime Minister David Cameron said that during the campaign that in the event of a vote to leave, what the British public will be voting for is to leave the EU and leave the single market. Delighted. Well, on that point, I do wish he wouldn't rewrite history. I've got lovely quotes here. The former Foreign Secretary, I'll vote to stay in the single market. I'm in favour of the single market. Yep. Yep. The Right Honourable for Shrop Member for Shropshire North, only a madman would actually leave the single market. That is speaks for itself. Uh, Air on banks, increasingly Norway, is the model. It is not the case as he is trying to say that it is. I thank the Honourable Lady for that intervention, but of course they were selective quotes, uh, indeed taken out of context. How could it not have been clear what the public were voting for? What I'd be delighted to. Friend, help us, sorry, my honourable friend, help us with this. Is he honestly saying that the good people of Colchester sat in a variety of hostilities? places where they might go and enjoy themselves, mulling over the finer parts and points of the single market. Is yes. it honestly it telling us that? <laughs> well, I, I thank the Honourable Lady exactly. for the intelligence, but I think she underestimates the intelligence. Yeah. 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 People of Colchester. Yeah. Uh, Mr Howarth, I would be more sympathetic to those bringing forward this amendment if they had not indeed voted in favour of holding this referendum itself. However, they supported it. They agreed to entrust this question to the British people. Now, I remember when some on the other side of the House, namely the Liberal Democrats, yeah. although I somewhat question that name in the context of this debate, yeah, yeah, yeah. were calling for a real referendum. Now, we had a real referendum, the biggest exercise in democracy in our nation's history, and we have been given a result. They just don't like what they heard. We should yeah. respect the instruction we've been given from the British people. Exactly. They were told yeah. we were going to leave the European Union and the single market, and leave we should. The Prime Minister has been absolutely clear that we are leaving the single market. Those on other benches bringing forward this amendment should, in my view, perhaps listen to the former leader of the Liberal Democrats, Noble Lord Ashdown of the other place, when he said, and I quote, when the British people have spoken, you do what they command. Yeah, 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 yeah. We do not need this debate. It is simply an attempt to obfuscate and delay the process, and that's why I cannot support this amendment. New clause is 56 or 134, and I encourage colleagues across the House to do the same. Yeah. Yeah. Helen Goodman. Very much, Mr. Howard. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship this afternoon. I'd like to speak to new clauses 29 and new clause 33, standing in my name and that of other honourable and right honourable colleagues. 
The Secretary of State, who's not here uh, for this debate, but uh, with his usual braggadocio, he said he would produce a bill that was unamendable. We have today a list of amendments which is 145 pages long. The ratio of lines in the bill to lines of amendment is 580 to 1. This must be an all-time record. It's certainly a tribute to the productivity of honourable members on this side of the House. But the chutzpah of the Secretary of State was exceeded by the civil servant who wrote paragraph 14 of the explanatory notes. This says the effect of the bill is clear and limited. No, the effect of this bill is not clear and it certainly isn't limited. And the fact that honourable members have presented so many amendments and new clauses demonstrates why this debate on parliamentary scrutiny is so important. I'm pleased to follow the honourable member for Colchester, who, uh, whose constituents voted leave, as mine did too. And actually, he gave the perfect introduction to my speech, because I want to describe to him and other honourable members why leave it's also in the interests of those who voted leave in the referendum that we should have proper parliamentary uh, uh, scrutiny. The referendum campaign was won on the slogan of bringing back control and parliamentary sovereignty. You can't bring back control and have parliamentary sovereignty without having proper parliamentary scrutiny. New Clause 29 is perfectly simple and straightforward. It is to have quarterly reporting system during the negotiations. This would give the House a structured approach. The Honourable Member for West Dorset complained about New Clause 3, which I thought was extremely ably moved by my Honourable Friend for Greenwich and Woolwich, that it, was, uh, it created all these problems with justiciability. Well, I hope he will agree that uh, being able to produce a report once a quarter is not such a high le and complex legal bar that it's going to lead to extremely long litigation. It's a simple, practical measure. Very, very grateful to the Honourable Lady for giving away. Um, uh, uh, does she imagine that there wouldn't be any court cases about whether the uh, quarterly reports were, as a matter of fact, in conformity with the appropriate proceeding? Is she aware of the chain of jurisprudence in judicial review which leads to the possibility of that kind of contest? And what does she think would happen if the courts did start intervening in whether the reports met the requirements of her amendment? Well, it's not clear that uh, such cases would, would get leave of hearing, point number one. And point number two, the, it would be dismissed straight away as long as the government abided by bringing quarterly reports. There just simply wouldn't be a case to answer. It's such a simple and straightforward point. So, so does the Honourable Lady mean that the government would satisfy the conditions of her amendment if they simply produced one line saying this is our report? Yes. Or does she have in mind that it would have to be an appropriate report? And if it had to be an appropriate report, couldn't a court decide whether it was appropriate or not? As the uh, chairman of the select committee said earlier, when we got into a discussion about the requests from the uh, opposition front bench, the nature of the report would be a matter for the government, and the government, I'm sure, would behave in a reasonable manner if this was in the legislation. I'll just make a little more progress, and then I'll, and then I'll give way. As I was saying to the Honourable Member for uh, Colchester, my constituency voted to leave. I voted for the bill at second reading in order that the Prime Minister should have the power to trigger our intention to withdraw from the European Union under Article 50. But the political legitimacy of the result of the referendum last summer does not extend to giving the government a complete blank cheque on their negotiating objectives and the way they conduct the negotiations. Obviously, everybody is clear that this will have major constitutional, political, economic and social implications. 
for our relations with other countries and for the domestic framework of our legislation. So given the lack of clarity and the fact that there was no plan, I have consulted my constituents on their expectations and hopes and how they want decisions to be taken. I wrote to 5,500 of them and I held six public meetings. They felt very strongly that they wanted Parliament to be involved. In fact, some of them thought that the negotiating team ought to be a cross-party team, and I said, well, I didn't really think that that was terribly likely. (laughs) (laughs) For example... Really? How is Liam Fox? Let me remind the Honourable Lady of the sort of views which might uh, not be expressed in her constituency but were certainly expressed in my constituency when we came to be looking at the social chapter and people's employment rights, where they said, in terms, you can't trust the Tories. It's because there is that feeling, that was their words, not my words, their words, it's because of that that we need to have parliamentary involvement in the way this process is carried forward. The Government have come very reluctantly to the House with this Bill. I first requested that uh, Parliament be involved on the 11th of July with a UQ on Article 50. They, they were resistant, as everybody knows, and only came because they were forced to do so by the Supreme Court. Some government backbenchers say that the whole negotiation is far too complex to do in an open way. The uh, Honourable Member for for Dorset West, for example, has talked about 3D chess. Well, I take the opposite view. It's precisely because it's complicated, it's precisely because it's multifaceted, that lots of people should be involved. I'm grateful to In terms of the negotiations, the vast majority of the amendments, I think I've counted 30 put down by members of the opposition, basically call for a report within 30 days of this Act coming out, uh, setting out the approach to be taken by the government in terms of our negotiations. Does she imagine that Europe will be publishing reports on every one of these issues, setting out their approach to the negotiations? Surely that's giving away far too much. Well, had the Honourable Member been in his place uh, to hear the fantastic speech by my Honourable Friend, the Member for Nottingham East, he would have understood why my Honourable Friend was proposing, uh, as he did, all those reports. But I'm speaking to new Clause 29, which is about quarterly reporting from the Government once the negotiations get underway. I think another... A uh, slight misconception on the, on the other benches is that uh, there is some best deal, yeah. as if there's some objective technical standard test. Well, clearly there isn't. What's best in the uh, Honourable Member's constituency of Gloucester might be different from what's best in my constituency of Bishop Auckland. This is not to cast aspersions on the motivations of the member of the government. It is simply to be realistic. I'm sure when the Prime Minister talks about building building a better Britain and doing the best for the country, I'm quite sure she's being completely sincere. But the fact is, in 1992, she came to Durham, she stood in a general election, and she got half the number of seats, uh, of votes, that the Labour candidate got. The truth of the matter is, this is complicated, there are different interests, and Parliament, which is the sovereign body of the country, should be able to participate fully in the process, and scrutiny is the basic first brick for this. That's a no. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Lady. But isn't the net effect of her proposed new clause is that it wouldn't be <laughs> Parliament who would be deciding on the adequacy or otherwise of the reporting back, but the High Court? And that, in fact, what she would be doing is ceding authority not to this place, but to the independent High Court. Precisely the contrary of what she's trying to achieve. Look, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry uh, that government members feel so badly that they lost the case in the Supreme Court last month. It's a shame. They were foolish to take. They were foolish to appeal 
after the High Court. But the fact that they've lost one case does not mean that they should become obsessed with this risk. And it is, it is as absurd as to say, well, we should stop having parliamentary questions for every department once a month, because somehow we're undermining the government. Absolutely. Take, for example, yeah. defence yeah. questions, which we have every single month. That's not undermining our security. That's holding the government to account. And because these negotiations are so important, that's precisely what we should be doing. So what I'm arguing, and I think the Secretary of State, I'm sorry the Secretary of State's not here, I think the Secretary of State, unlike some of the government backbenchers, understands that this is not a technical issue, this is a political process. It's the, and so involving Parliament and having proper parliamentary scrutiny is the right thing to do to build the national consensus, which the White Paper says is the government's aim. New Clause 29 is very simple and straightforward, a quarterly reporting system during the negotiations. And while the select committees are doing fantastic work looking at particular issues in great detail, it's extremely important that the whole House gets a regular opportunity to look at how things are going and to look from the perspective of the different communities which we all represent. Out of necessity, I drafted new clause 29 without seeing new clause 3. New clause 3 is obviously tougher than new clause 29, so some people will prefer new clause uh, 3 and some people will prefer new clause 29 for that very reason. I'd just like to say a couple of words about new clause 33. New clause 33 requires the Prime Minister to set out how the, the, the UK will have control over its immigration system. I tabled it because this is the major concern of very many people, but particularly very many people who voted Leave. So it seems right to refer to it in the draft framework and the negotiating objectives which we must prepare for our future relationship with the EU. However, I want to make it clear that in these discussions I had with my constituents, while this was a factor for, for some of them in the way they voted, they were equally committed to providing EU citizens in this country with security. And I have signed new clause 57, which my right honourable and learned friend, the member for Peckham, um, Camberwell and Peckham, has put down, because these things are completely consistent. I would like to say more about this, but because of the very short amount of time which we have. I'm for the Honourable Lady for giving way because she has talked about the guaranteeing the rights of EU citizens. And the Honourable Member for North East Somerset, who was in this place, I think stated the legal position. There is a way round for the Government tonight to guarantee those rights, to say that he was correct, that they would guarantee that they would then move those rights and grandfather those rights straight into the Immigration Bill. That would give, it may not be the preferred method for many in this House, but that would guarantee EU citizens what they want effectively. Does she not agree with me? Well, uh, I haven't thought about it in as much detail as the Honourable Gentleman, but it will be very interesting to see what the Minister who responds to this de debate says at the dispatch box tonight. As I was saying, I think that we should have proper scrutiny, we should have it in a structured way. I'm very disappointed that we haven't got slightly longer to look at all these things in more detail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Richard Fuller. Yeah. Um, Pleasure to follow the uh, Honourable Lady Member for Bishop Auckland, who expressed her view with her uh, usual forthrightness, uh, and also to mention that she was one of the first members of this House to raise the complex issues of the Customs Union. I'm very grateful for her for doing that. Um, Ms. Alth, I was one of uh, five. Ah, last July it was. Last July, the right hon. member for Lee proposed an opposition amendment on the very topic of guaranteeing the rights of EU nationals in the United Kingdom, and I was one of five uh, Conservative members of Parliament to support the opposition uh, on that motion. I think that was an excellent motion to be proposed at that time, and I would point out that thanks to that motion, there has been tremendous progress made in terms of the thinking uh, of the government and, most importantly, the statements of uh, the government. It is perhaps uh, the fact that we are here debating an issue 
where there is uni unanimity of view about what we want to achieve, almost to, uh, to the point of parity that everyone's agreeing on a point they're then going to disagree about. So the fundamental question is whether placing this on this bill is the right approach to continuing the pressure and progress uh, to achieve what the, my honourable friend from Cambridge herself uh, spoke about so eloquently in her piece. On that point, would my honourable friend give way? I will, very briefly. Thank you. I just wanted to briefly mention, um, <coughs> my honourable friend talks about whether it's the right place for this to be on this bill. Um, should it be that we in this country we need legislation to orientate our moral compass? <laughs> well, I think the, my honourable friend knows my uh, views on that, that uh, so let me not dwell too much. But I would say specifically, as I look through the many amendments on this bill, they fall into three main pools, those that are asking or requiring uh, scrutiny of the government's approach, those that seek to frame a position of the, for the government in negotiations, and thirdly, those that are seeking answers to an imponderable list of questions, most notably those uh, from the Honourable Member for Nottingham East. Uh, I, I think actually they are in declining issue of value uh, of uh, attention of this House. The question of scrutiny, I think, is very relevant to how the House sees proceeding on this. And I am, uh, will listen very carefully to see what the front bench talks about on uh, scrutiny. I am concerned, though, from some of the comments made and not answered by the right honourable member for Dorset West, the idea that we would involve the government in negotiations and then involve Parliament in negotiations and then involve the courts also in negotiations, seems to me to bring the words dogs and breakfast very closely together uh, very, very quickly. I do think on the issue of foreign EU national, EU nationals here in the UK, many of the contributions in the debate have focused on the easier side of the arguments. As my uh, right honourable friend, the men, uh, uh, member for Forest of Dean, mentioned, uh, the issue of prisoners in the UK. Uh, on the uh, amendment, those prisoners who had committed crimes in this country would be guaranteed rights to remain in this country. Now, we may want to do that, but I think it's a very hard case to make that we should do that whilst not giving any concern or consideration to those uh, in other, uh, British nationals in other EU countries. That seems to me to be, as my honourable friend from Cambridge herself might say, losing our moral compass through legislation. I think we have underestimated. There have been a number of people who have cited specific examples in this debate where those people would actually already be guaranteed rights into, in this country. I think as parliamentarians we have a responsibility to reduce uncertainty as we go through this process of leaving the EU. And one very practical way that we can do that is, is knowing what the circumstances are for each of our constituents who come and talk to us so that we can explain to them that there is no need for them to be concerned because their rights are secured. That will not cover all of them. It may not cover as large proportions as the Honourable Member for Newark mentioned, but it is a practical example where we can help reduce uh, uncertainty. And I think the third argument is we have directed all of our approaches on this issue upon which we all agree, of keeping people with the right here, EU's with the, with the right to remain, EU nationals with the right to remain here. We focused all our attention, uh, Ms. Howard, on the government's front bench. Hardly a person has mentioned Angela Merkel. Yeah. Now, as I understand it, and I get it from two very reputable newspapers, The Sun and The Express, so it must be true, <laughs> I understand that it was Mrs Merkel who said no to a deal. So where are our voices talking about pressuring the German government yeah. to make an agreement on that? Well, I've heard plenty of speeches today hey. talking about Donald Trump and how we feel terrible about his policies. Well, here's something that affects British citizens in another country, and not a word from anyone on that issue. A word indeed. Wouldn't you agree, then, that it, by triggering Article 50, we simply give the EU 27 all the rights to deliver our, our future? And we have no negotiation then, and that's why we should delay Article 50 and tell the people of the final sale and negotiating package and that we are the negotiating right as full members. We have the power of time, and we give them the incentive that we might vote to stay in the EU to come to the negotiating table. I don't, think, I don't think the Honourable Member would have got a, a, a top mark in negotiation analysis <laughs> at Harvard Business School. And also, I think the last word the British public want to hear when it comes to this bill is delay. Yeah, I think yeah, most yeah, people yeah, think yeah. we should get on with it if they don't think we've done it uh, already. Uh, but, Mr. Mr. Howarth, if I, if I may uh, go on. Um, 
I think it is important for the government to understand that messaging here is important. There is uncertainty, and people do feel that perhaps they don't have the right to remain here. So the government must continue its progress in signalling to people not only that we welcome them here, but that our intent, our intent is that everyone who has, is in the United Kingdom as a legal EU resident will be able to stay in the government. We must not avoid or, uh, 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 or, or not pursue uh, communicating that message. But equally, the government must avoid state measures, must avoid measures that give the optics to those British citizens in other EU countries that they have been abandoned. Yeah. One of the worst things from uh, supporting this in legislation is not that it is necessarily a bad thing, but that the optics of that for British citizens in other countries would change dramatically. They would say, well, why have we not been protected? They would feel even more vulnerable because of the inactions of EU governments if the UK government was by statute to, have, uh, to take this. So I will be supporting the government on this uh, amendment. I call on the government to continue with its progress on this issue to end uncertainty. And may I add to that that in ending uncertainty, it isn't just about the rights of EU nationals currently living in the UK. It is about wanting people who are in the European Union to come to the UK. That message, that progressive message of this government, shouldn't just end with the issues that are constrained in the uh, amendment that's proposed today, but we should have a very positive message that we will continue to accept, continue to welcome members of the European Union after we leave. To um, support the new clauses and amendments moved by my friend from North East Fife earlier today, but I also wish to speak uh, in particular to new clause 51 in the name of the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Pontypridd. And in particular, I wish to support the argument that the white paper must and should include details of the expected trajectory for the UK balance of trade, GDP and unemployment. And I think we saw a number of contributions earlier today that would explain precisely why we need that. Uh, first was my honourable friend from North East Fife, who said that the Vote Leave campaign failed to provide detailed answers to any of the key economic questions before the referendum. Uh, and of course he's right. But there was also the contribution from the right honourable gentleman, the member for Forest of Dean, who's no longer in his place. And I think he demonstrated incredibly ably the confusion at the heart of the Vote Leave campaign and why decision taking today is incredibly difficult. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, and I've said this to him, so there's no surprise to him, he effectively said no one in the leadership of the official Leave campaign uh, ever argued that we would join the EEA or have an EFTA type agreement. Now, it may have been that the right honourable gentleman, the member for Surrey Heath, or one of these other senior figures never quite said that, but to argue the Leave campaign did not suggest that and suggest it strongly is simply wrong. The Leave campaign lawyers for Britain said we could apply to rejoin with effect from the day after Brexit. EFTA membership would allow us to continue uninterrupted free trade relations, etc. That was still on their website only a few weeks ago. The former ambassador and Brexit supporter Charles Crawford appeared on Newsnight and argued an EEA option may be the first step in Brexit. Roland Smith, the author of The Liberal Case to Leave, wrote an extended paper entitled Evolution, Not Revolution, The Case for the EEA Option. So I suspect there were many people who indeed voted for Brexit believing that we weren't voting for a hard Tory cliff edge Brexit, that we would maintain membership of the EEA or EFTA or an equivalent. And I think, given that that now no longer appears to be the case, then it's absolutely right, as the Honourable Gentleman's motion a new clause makes clear, that we have details of the expected trajectory of the balance of trade, GDP and unemployment. Um, I'll make a little progress then, I will. But these are not abstracts, Mr Howarth. They are at the heart of the measurement of our economy, of wages, of living standards, of economic growth. They are the platform for tax yield, which pays for our vital public services. 
And all of those words and concepts were almost entirely absent from what I'll call generously the first white paper. But before I make progress, let me just observe gently that it's not good enough for the government to produce a white paper after a referendum, after sets of votes, which is little more than the Prime Minister's Lancaster House speech, dressed up with a few pictures and a couple of graphs. This is not the basis for the economic plan necessary to mitigate the huge potential damage to the economy from a hard Tory Brexit. And make no mistake, that is what we are facing, and I will happily give way. Give me a very quick intervention. To say, did the government leaflet uh, great cost not um, exactly make this point that single market membership was not on option, but it was access that would be the result of the referendum and a leave vote? Well, there may have been many things said, and that's the point I'm making. There was access to the single market. Some might argue being in the EEA, a member of EFTA, precisely gives one not just access, but membership of. One could call it access if one likes. Um, so there was deep, deep confusion in the messaging of the no side, which must be rectified now with proper details on the trajectory of the key economic numbers before more decisions are taken. Now, I said we are facing a hard Brexit. Let us understand what it is that has been said. The leaked, Tory, uh, the leaked Treasury document last November suggested the UK could lose up to, up to £66 billion from a hard Brexit. The GDP could fall by around 9.5 per cent if the UK reverted to WTO rules. This is worst-case scenario. I accept that. But nevertheless, without a plan to mitigate that, should the circumstances occur which lead us to that catastrophe, then the guilt would be on the part of the government for failing to plan. And of course, the last part of that, if we revert to WTO rules, is key. Key because the Prime Minister has said a bad deal is worse than no deal. But that's very twisted logic, Mr Howard. Because no deal is the worst deal, it means we do revert immediately to WTO rules, with all the tariffs and other regulatory burdens that implies. But of course, the leaked Treasury document wasn't published in isolation. Uh, the LSE, the Centre for Economic Performance, published very similar numbers. They said, in the long run, reduced trade lowers productivity, already a huge problem for the UK. They said that, increases, that increases the, cost, sorry, the increased cost of Brexit would lead to a loss of between 6.3 and 9.5 per cent of GDP. And they put a range of figures on that, between £4,200 and £6,500 per household. And I think when we consider that impact in terms of the impact on real people, it begins to have a substantial measure of strength to the argument. And the figures in Scotland, independently produced by the Fraser of Alder Institute, are in line with those other assessments. They suggest a hard Brexit could result in the loss of some 80,000 Scottish jobs within a decade and a drop in wages of averaging around £2,000. I don't think anyone, any politician of any party, would willingly say, let's embark on a course of action which will lead to the near impoverishment of many people in society. But that is where we are with the hard Tory Brexit argument. And when we, uh, well, I, I, can, I, can hear the, I can hear the groans, Mr Howarth. We had, uh, we had year after year of long-term economic plan, which failed at every turn. I think it's better if we argue that what we're facing today is a hard Brexit, a cliff-edge bre Brexit, and prepare for it. That makes sense. And when the, if we add to that, add to the assessments which have already been done, today's report that senior executives in the FTSE 500 companies tell us that Brexit vote, the Brexit vote is already having a negative impact on business. That should have alarm bells ringing throughout government. Instead, there is simply complacency. Or the British Chambers report telling us almost half of businesses surveyed have already seen a hit to margins due to the devaluation caused by the fear of Brexit, with more than half suggesting they will have to increase prices. Now, all the more reason to have the kind of assessment and understanding of the tra trajectory 
of many of the key metrics and the plans to mitigate the worst impact. And all of that, Mr Howarth, is before we get to the vexed question of balance of trade. A current account for the last full year, eighty billion in the red. A deficit in the trade and goods, a hundred and twenty billion in the red. Yet we are faced with a Brexit which will make this worse, ripping the UK and Scotland out of the world's largest and most successful trading bloc. And to do this without the clear assessment asked for of the damage and any credible plan to mitigate it, included in a comprehensive white paper, is, in my view, Mr Howarth, an act of willful economic vandalism. Order. Um, I am anxious to um, get, as certainly those people who have sat throughout the debate uh, and tried to get in, as many of them as possible. Um, but in order to do so, there is no time limit, and I am not in a, going to impose one. But if those who remain all take five minutes or preferably less, it might be possible to get all of them in. Sarah Wollaston. I would like to start by reading from a letter I have received from a constituent, um, talking about his wife who was born in the Netherlands. And he, he writes that she has lived in this country for over 30 years, brought up three British children and is completely integrated into the life of her local town. She is not part of any immigrant community. She just lives here and is fully at home here. Till now, she has never seen herself as an outsider and has been able to participate fully in local life thanks to her rights as an EU citizen. In two years' time, she will lose those rights and be a foreigner, dependent on the goodwill of the government of her day. Now, I have written back to my constituent and met with him because I think it is inconceivable that our Prime Minister would separate this family. Um, however, many people are not reassured. And he and his wife sought for her to have permanent residency. An 85-page document, including an English language test and a test of life in Britain, insulting, frankly, to someone who's lived here for all of her life, yeah, yeah. most of her life, and, and brought up three children here. Yeah, yeah. Also very expensive. But then the final sting in the tail for this is she finds she's not eligible because she's been self-employed and hasn't taken out comprehensive sickness insurance. I think this situation is frankly unacceptable. I think that what we need to do is to keep our compassion and to keep this simple. As I say, I think it's inconceivable that families such as this would be separated. So we should be absolutely clear in saying so up front. Of course. I'm a more friendly human way, and uh, I completely understand what she's saying in terms of her own constituent surgeries. I've had a very similar experience, and it really is very deeply upsetting in many respects. But would you join me as well in just reflecting that the, uh, the, the EU and, as I say, Chancellor Merkel, that we could have come to a deal about this earlier, but the reality is that they have actually point blank refused to discuss this before we trigger Article 50. Of course, I am agreed with this, and I have also heard from British citizens who are my constituents now living in the European Union. But my point is that I think, come what may, it is inconceivable that we would seek to separate families such as this. And there is no doubt that many people that we are all seeing in our surgeries are sleepless and even sick with worry about it. It is true. These are people that I am seeing in my surgery. And the other point that we need to make is just to consider the sheer tsunami of paperwork and that we will have to deal with in settling the rights of these citizens if we don't get on with this quickly. We need to keep this simple. There is no way that families such as this should be subjected to a vast bureaucracy, vast expense, we all know that this needs to be settled, um, and so I would say that in negotiating, surely making a bold, open offer as a gesture of, of goodwill can do nothing but good in this situation. I give way. I agree with my honourable friend. And my question to my honourable friend is: Can she cast any thought about why the Chancellor of Germany refused the offer? I, I have no idea why this is happening, but what I am saying to you is that I think that as an important point to the Chancellor 
um, of Germany, making this clear unilateral offer is the right thing to do. And we should get on and do it. There is no reason not to do so. Because even if other countries were to take an obstructive and unreasonable line here, I still feel it would be inconceivable that our Prime Minister would separate families such as my constituent. And so let's get on. Of course. I'm very grateful to uh, my honourable friend for giving her, but does she not agree with me? The Prime Minister has given her word that this will be a priority. She clearly hears the compassion that the Honourable Lady reflects in her constituency, constituents and indeed all of us. And we, we must, and I certainly, accept the word of the Prime Minister. This will be her priority and she will sort it. I thank my Honourable Friend and I agree. I do trust the Prime Minister and this is why I have taken a very reassuring line with my constituents. However, there is no substitute for actually a very clear statement from our Prime Minister that, come what may, that families such as this will not be <coughs> separated, because I think this is the reassurance they seek. Um, so I think, frankly, hearing what my honourable friend says, I think let's get on and make that offer. It can be nothing but good <coughs> to do so. Um, I also hope that the Prime Minister will take further action on the issue of those who work in our NHS and social care. Um, one in ten of the doctors that work in our NHS come from elsewhere in the European Union, and I'd like to say thank you on behalf of the whole House yeah, yeah, to all yeah. of those workers, and also to those who are working in social care. Yeah. And I also think it would be very much a positive move if we could up front say that those who are working here will be welcome to stay and make it very clear that we will continue to make it easy to welcome people from across the European Union to work in social care and our NHS. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Howard. Um, I'm going to try and make a, a very short pointed speech here today because I think a lot of honourable members have been here for this debate and I must say in beginning that it's extraordinary that we are debating one of the most, if not the most important, economic, social, strategic decision this House has had to make, certainly in the six years I've been here, and arguably for 70 years, and we are trying to do it in a few short days and hours. My amendment that I want to speak to is uh, Amendment uh, New Clause 51. It is a simple, good-hearted amendment that seeks to get the government to come clean with the country and explain what it now thinks, what this government thinks the impact of Brexit is going to mean for our constituents and for our national interests. It talks about labour rights, it talks about uh, health and safety legislation, it talks about environmental protections. Most importantly, it talks about the impact that we are likely to see on our GDP, on our balance of trade, on those fundamental metrics to dictate whether we succeed or fail as a nation. And I tabled this amendment, Mr Howarth, before we saw the abject, lamentable piece of work that the government produced last Thursday, the white paper, the 70-odd skimpy pages of white paper, 10% of which is actually white or blocked out. It's the whitest white paper I think the House has ever seen. And I contrast it with the 200-odd page report that the Treasury produced in advance of the referendum, detailing minutiae all of the impacts that were anticipated as a result of these changes in respect of GDP, in respect, well, they chunter on the benches opposite, but when the Prime Minister was sat on that bench as Home Secretary, she signed up to every line of this. So I think it is entirely legitimate for the country to ask, is the Prime Minister now living a lie? as to what she thinks the impact of Brexit will be. Is she deceiving the country about whether this is going to turn out well for us or not? Because let us not forget, Mr Howarth, that this paper did suggest that the net impact of uh, leaving the European Union on our GDP was going to be in the order of £45 billion pounds per annum within 15 years. That's a third of the budget of the NHS. It would require a 10 pence increase in the basic rate of taxation to fill that black hole. Now, it may well be entirely untrue 
Perhaps it was just an estimate by experts in the Treasury, which we shouldn't believe any longer. But if so, the government needs to come clean and tell us what is the current estimate. Now we know what the government is planning to do. Now we know it is the rock-hard Brexit that they hate to hear about on the other side that we are gunning for. What will the impact be? And what will the impact be on trade? Because the government was very, very clear. Under any circumstances, leaving the European Union will reduce trade by this country. Yep. It will make us, to quote the Treasury, permanently poorer. As a result of reduced trade, reduced activity, reduced receipts, forcing the government to increase and prolong austerity in this country. That's the stakes that we are playing for on behalf of our constituents in this place, in this debate. And it seems to me entirely right that if this House is to be worthy of the name of the Houses of Parliament, if it is going to do its job as it's meant to, as it has done for centuries, we need to see the detail. We need to be clear about what this is going to mean for my constituents, for my children. And if it is anything like the black picture that was previously painted, we must have a final meaningful vote in this House as to the terms. We cannot allow this country to drift out of the European Union on the bad deal of World Trade Organization terms that would mean the £45 billion black hole was realised in our public finances. We cannot allow that to happen for future generations. And we will be held accountable by those future generations. If this House sits by supine, pusillanimous, allowing this to be waved through this House for political purposes, to end the 30 year civil war on the Tory benches, I cannot stand for that in this House. Yeah, we should yeah, not stand yeah, for that yeah, in this yeah. House. We should see the detail. We should hold the government to account, and I will continue to do that throughout this debate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Howth. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, and I rise to move new clause 56, tabled in my name and the names of honourable and right honourable members from across the House. And I hope this will pick up cross-party support, because this amendment places the future of our economy, the future and jobs and trade at the centre of um, the debate, where I believe that it should be. Because in leaving the European Union, as people have voted for us to do, there remains an outstanding question of what happens in terms of our membership of the single market and the customs union. Because contrary to what we were told earlier by the right honourable member for the Forest of Dean. This was not a clear issue during the referendum. Yeah. There were differences of opinion on the Remain side and the Leave side. And given that ambiguity on something as important as this, it's quite right that Parliament, in taking yeah. back control, yeah. 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 should at least give the government a steer about the future trading relationship that we would like to see. Because as members of the Single Market and Customs Union, we're part of the largest free trade area in the world, giving us unfettered access to half a billion consumers across the continent of Europe. I certainly will. Gentlemen, would he not agree with me it is uh, best unfortunate that his front bench hasn't used its opposition supply days to have exactly that debate and indeed a vote on the single market, the customs union and indeed the free movement of people? Well, I just say with respect to the Honourable Lady, who I have a lot of respect for the way she's conducted herself during the debate, her criticisms of our front bench, and in particular the shadow Brexit team, I think are particularly unfair, but in any case, her criticism of our front bench would carry more weight in this House if she was clearer about which voting lobby she is going to be walking yeah, through yeah, on a number of yeah. crucial issues. It's all very well taking to the airwaves and speaking in the newspaper about the fight that you'll put up, or she will put up, Mr yeah, Chairman, yeah, on these issues. Yeah, yeah. But no, she's got to it. vote where her vote mouth is. I will give way again. I've made it very clear that I very much hope that the government will see the good sense as uh, has been put forward in much of the wording of new clause 110 uh, and uh, some sort of compromise and sense can be achieved. But I make it very clear in the absence of that, uh, I will find myself perhaps with no alternative but to go against my government, the last thing I want to do. I'm um, terribly disappointing, but nonetheless, as members of the Single Market and Customs Unions, we're part of the largest free trade 
area in the world. And we've, we've heard a lot about global trade and our relationship with the rest of the world. But what's often overlooked is that membership of the European Single Market and Customs Union facilitates global trade. In fact, it has more free trade agreements with the rest of the world than the United States of America, China, Canada, Japan, Russia, India and Brazil. Every single sector of our economy will be affected by the decision and the, the outcome of the negotiations that our government make. And last week the cat was let out of the bag, or should I say in the case of the right honourable member for Rushcliffe, the rabbit uh, was let out of Alice's Wonderland, because the former Chancellor, the right honourable member for Rushcliffe, pointed out that the idea that we will leave the most advanced and sophisticated free trade agreement in the world and there will be queuing up countries around the world that will give us as favourable terms, as good for our economy, is fanciful. And if that weren't bad enough, we should listen to the right honourable member for Tatton, because my jaw dropped when I heard him utter these words. He said the Prime Minister has chosen not to make the economy the priority in this negotiation. I'm just going to repeat this, not to make the economy the priority in this negotiation. We are leaving the European Union. There is a real risk that the Prime Minister is going to drive a coach and horses through the biggest single trade agreement and free trade area in the world that we're part of. She's going to drive a coach and horses through that, divorce us from the single market, divorce us from the customs union, with implications for jobs, for trade, for investment, for the jobs of my constituents, for the jobs of every constituency, uh, every constituency of every member of this House. And yet the economy is not the priority in this negotiation. I think this is an outrageous yeah, prospectus. Yeah, yeah. How could any member of the party opposite support a prospectus that does not place the economy at the forefront yeah. of our departure from the European Union? Absolutely. It is reckless. Yep. It is irresponsible. Yep. If we were behaving like this, they would be attacking us yeah, yeah. and saying that we lack economic credibility. This lot don't even put the economy on the agenda. It's an absolute outrage. I'm sorry I've given way already, and I'm really conscious that other people want to, want to come in. The government should be seeking to get the best possible trading relationship with the European Union uh, as it possibly can. And I cannot fathom why the Prime Minister isn't setting out to keep Britain in a reformed single market. Pri Margaret Thatcher was the architect. No. I won't give way. I won't give way. And I want to draw my remarks to a conclusion so that other people can draw in. I think, by the way, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it is outrageous that we have not had enough time to debate yeah, these substantial yeah, yeah, issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would just say, Margaret Thatcher was the architect of the single market. The Prime Minister could be the architect of a reformed single market. Yeah. And in terms of the consequences and the choices and the trade-offs that lie ahead, whether on rules, on freedom of movement, on financial contribution, we should not give this government a blank cheque. They haven't earned it. Any government that enters a process like this and says that the economy is not the priority does not deserve the trust of this House and doesn't deserve the trust of the British people. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Mr Howarth. I very much support the amendments um, that are designed to increase parliamentary scrutiny. I have signed many of them, and I very much support those amendments that are about giving the right to EU nationals now to remain. This is a moral issue, not some kind of trans transactional calculation, and that should be guaranteed now. But, Mr Howarth, I rise to raise an issue that has not yet been discussed, and it is in my new Clause 36. It is the issue of transitional arrangements. Now, I welcome the White Paper's recognition that if a deal can be successfully secured within the two-year period once Article 50 is triggered, then we won't leave the EU literally overnight. There will be a phased implementation to give business in particular the chance to adapt. But that is not the same thing as needing a period of transition should two years not provide sufficient to reach an agreement. And to have no idea of what that agreement is going to be is a glaring omission. That is what my amendment seeks to address, a transitional arrangement to govern UK-EU trade relations during the period, if necessary, between when the UK leaves the EU and when a longer-term agreement is concluded. Because currently, when we hit the two-year mark, which in reality is more like 18 months, given the requirement to bring the deal before MPs, the European Parliament and so on, given that very short amount of time, the only option, if a deal has not been secured, 
is essentially to send Britain over a cliff edge. We'd face having to leave the EU effectively overnight, crashing out on WTO-only terms. Now, the government has stated very clearly in its white paper that it wants to avoid cliff edges, but at the moment it's done nothing to try to stay away from this one. Perhaps it's been too busy looking the other way over the Atlantic and it simply hasn't noticed it. But my amendment is a safety net. Now, given that both France and Germany are going to be preoccupied with national elections for much of this year, coupled with the limited negotiating capacity and relative inexperience of the UK team, it seems very likely that two years will not be sufficient time to get the best deal for Britain. So if we come to the end of the two-year period, we need a plan that isn't just the default option of the Wild West that is the WTO. Yeah. Now, the Prime Minister says that she has unanimous agreement with the other 27 member states, that, that, that getting that unanimous agreement is an option. Well, we need to know that that's being specifically discussed, that option of continuing the negotiations. And we need to know that before we secure Article, and before we trigger Article 50. Otherwise, we risk yet more uncertainty for our economy, for the citizens living in the EU, and for all of our, our constituents. It's very much, Mr Howarth, like jumping out of a plane to escape someone you've fallen out with and failing to double-check that there's a parachute in the, pack, in the pack that they have strapped on your back. Now, what possible reason would anyone have for being so complacent or foolhardy? Exiting the EU is really about two separate processes. No, I won't, because there isn't time. And many in the EU want us to conclude the divorce element, which comes with a potential bill of 60 billion euros, before discussing a trade deal. We must not forget that this is a negotiation. Article 50 only covers administrative Brexit, not the legal or trade aspects. So if, after two years, we don't yet even have a basic divorce deal, it's possible there will be frayed, tempers, dwindling patients, and in such circumstances, the prospect of starting negotiations on trade deals is rather unlikely, to put it mildly. The 27 other countries will likely want to get agreement on the divorce settlement agreed via the courts, so trade negotiations may not even be possible, even if the political, is where, even if the political will is there. So for all of those reasons, Mr Howarth, we absolutely need to have this transition arrangement in place. I didn't give way because I want to give uh, space for my colleagues behind us, but let me just reiterate how frustrating it is that of a debate of this importance, we're having to rattle through it at this ridiculous rate. Yeah. Jim Shannon, could, could I, before the Honourable Member starts, could I say there is one further member to be accommodated in the time available? I realise it's very tight, but if he could be brief, that would be helpful. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Chairman. Um, I must start by, first of all, thanking the government for the opportunity to, uh, and to the promise on the referendum that was given. Quite clearly, people, the government said they would listen to the will of the people in a true democratic form and adhere to that. Uh, and, and, and the people in the referendum also said they wanted Article 50 to be triggered by the 31st of March. That is part of the exceptional circumstances we have, and that is why we are debating this here tonight as well. Um, I, I come from a constituency that had voted 54 per cent to 46 per cent uh, to leave the EU. No, and, and with that in mind, uh, I, I think it is very, very clear that we wish to, to see this going forward. I hope that today we will not face more efforts to derail the process. The train is en route and is going at a steady pace. Our duty and the duty of government is to set the tracks in the right way, a strong and safe track to carry us out of Europe and back to independence. As a Northern Ireland MP, um, there are clearly specific issues relating to our border with the Republic of Ireland, issues relating to our businesses and farming community and communities that are unique to us. But I have also every faith in our Prime Minister and the team and the discussions that she, the Prime Minister had with uh, the Taoiseach in the Republic of Ireland just last week. Those uh, were clearly the, the body language was positive, the verbal contact was positive, and we should have every faith in what goes forward. At the same time, I just want, if I can, Mr Chairman, refer to the um, uh, clause, uh, new Clause 6 and clause, New Clause 14. There is the argument that this amendment does not make clear who the protection does apply to, and I have concerns with the scope of the amendment. I am proud of the fact that I hail from a constituency which is a massive agri-food industry and including businesses which supply not simply the UK but are globally recognised and trusted. I have manufacturers who ship to the Middle East, to America, to Europe and branching out to the Far East. Mass Direct, one of the major uh, employers in my constituency, employs some 40 per cent of their workforces from Eastern Europe. Willowbrook Foods is some 60 per cent of their workforce. We have asked uh, 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 and Lakeland Dairies, who, who look after the Pritchett Foods and Rich Sauces, all these contribute to some 2,000 jobs. Some of the workers have met and married locals. There must be no roadblocks to their ability to remain and work in the country and live their, their lives. 
I spoke to the minister, the, the DEFRA minister, when she came to Northern Ireland just a, a couple of months ago, uh, when she visited the, some of those, those, uh, those uh, factories and spoke to the people. She said she was very keen to ensure that the people working in the factories wanted security and tenure, and I fully support this. However, in saying all of this, I must underline my, my uh, opening remarks, and that is a view that is those who are living and working and integrating into society and the local economy deserve this protection. And I believe that the PM is well within her rights to ensure that those who do l- live and work here are married to a British person should have the ability to remain. And with that in mind, and I conclude with this, there is no doubt that we must curb migration which does not enhance life in the UK in relation to economic migrants, but we must also ensure that the paramount concern is allowing businesses to continue to retain their workforce without fear and have the ability to unequivocally offer job security to that workforce in order to keep the workers right here in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Ian Knight. I'll keep my, um, my comments very brief indeed, because I'm aware of uh, time shortages. Um, I was for remaining in the referendum, mainly because of the potential for short and medium-term economic dislocation, particularly within my constituency, which I have to say is likely to be a constituency which has amongst the highest trade surplus with the EU, mostly off the bonnet of Jaguar Land Rovers that we sell into the, uh, the single market. So I was for, for remain. However, that debate was lost, and I still think we do face difficult times ahead. I do believe in free trade. I think we have to strike out the best we can do. But it is going to be tough in a world of protectionism, uh, or growing protectionism. But what the key is that when we are leaving the EU, we have to make the best possible deal. And for me, Mr Howarth, this does not mean that we have membership of the single market, because on the doorsteps during the referendum campaign, and I have to say for years before, the message was loud and clear, no freedom of movement. People don't want freedom of movement, and the single market comes with that requirement. So that is off the table straight away, as the Prime Minister has made very clear. As for the customs union, the difficulties with that are, effectively, we wouldn't be able to therefore have our own trade deals with the rest of the world. We would be hamstrung. And I have to say, this whole idea of the EEA and customs unions and single market membership, these are many of our anti-chambers to entry into the EU. We are leaving the EU. We are a country of 65 million people, a sophisticated, large economy. It is completely inappropriate to have that type of model. We need our own model. And any attempts to frustrate that through these amendments or to allow uh, to have the government expose its hand too early will damage our negotiation in that respect. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Howarth. And uh, this is uh, a short bill, uh, which has attracted a very large number of amendments. Uh, but they do fall into a number of broad categories. And uh, I'll deal first of all with the issue of parliamentary scrutiny, which has uh, engaged the attention of a large number of honourable and right honourable members. And con- listen- listening to the debate, it's uh, very clear that there is actually uh, a considerable amount of common ground across the chamber. Uh, The government believes also that parliamentary scrutiny is essential as we withdraw from the European Union. Uh, Indeed, the whole object of leaving the European Union is to ensure that our parliament can take back of our own laws, and for that purpose, scrutiny is essential. Now, I recognise the thoughtfulness of the wording of uh, many of the uh, amendments uh, which we have considered this afternoon, which seek to formalise the mode of uh, s- scrutiny, but I think it will uh, probably surprise nobody that uh, I will not be uh, accepting any of them. This is a straightforward bill, uh, which gives us uh, the means to respect the result of the referendum uh, and also the judgment of the Supreme Court. And as the Court itself made absolutely clear, this is not about whether we leave or the terms upon which we leave, but simply about the mechanics under which we trigger the process of leaving. And in many cases, the amendments which we have uh, heard uh, discussed today have virtually nothing to do with a bill. And I resist the amendments in this group for two principal reasons. Firstly, a lot of them are unnecessary uh, in that what they are seeking to achieve is effectively already being done by the government. 
Uh, it, no one can deny that uh, my right honourable friend, uh, the Secretary of State, as indeed uh, the honourable gentleman for, from, for Greenwich and Woolwich recognised, uh, has been absolutely assiduous in his engagement uh, with Parliament. It's been the source of intense scrutiny over the past se seven months, and I would suggest, uh, Mr. Ha uh, I'll give way. Uh, thank you. I'm wondering if the Minister can tell us if reassuring EU nationals is unnecessary. Well, I, I will come to EU nationals later, but as I explained a moment ago, I'm dealing at this moment with the issue of scrutiny and not with the issue of uh, EU nationals. Uh, one can see from the Secretary of State's uh, record of engagement that he's given an oral statement on an almost monthly basis, far more than the monthly or bi-monthly or quarterly updates to Parliament uh, re requested in these amendments. Ministers from across government have been at this dispatch box many, many times to debate our EU exit. The Prime Minister has given a statement after every Council, including one today, and that's in addition to holding uh, debates on the EU exit in government time, 15 appearances at select committees by ministers and officials from all departments. I'll give way. Way, and I'm pleased that he understands that parliamentary scrutiny is essential. Sovereignly. But what we've heard from uh, government backbenchers is that once the negotiations begin, everything has to close down. And therefore, what has happened in the last seven months is not strictly speaking relevant to what will happen over the next two years. And therefore, the purpose of new clause three and new clause 28 is a forward looking scrutiny. Exactly. David May I say to the Honourable Lady that I understand the point that she's making. Uh, it is not, however, the case that everything is going, as she puts it, to close down. Uh, there will certainly be negotiations, and it's important that those negotiations do continue uh, to uh, a certain extent in terms of privacy. But uh, at the same time, this government has made it absolutely clear, time after time, that we fully uh, appreciate the need for engagement with this Parliament and for scrutiny by, by this Parliament, provided, of course, it does not adversely affect those negotiations. I'll give way one, one more time. Will you agree that uh, the final deal should, in fact, be scrutinised by the British people, who should have the final say on whether this deal represents their reasonable expectations when they voted to leave? And if it doesn't, they should have the chance to stay in the EU. Uh, the, the British people have had their say. They've had their say very clearly. They have instructed this Parliament that they wish to leave the European Union. I know that the Honourable Gentleman doesn't like that result, but that is the hard fact. We have aimed at all times scrupulously to fulfil Parliament's legitimate need for information, and we will continue to do so. And as well as keeping Parliament informed, we will pay regard to all the motions passed on the outcome of negotiations associated by, this, by the Bill, as proposed in new clause 176, just as we have already paid regard to the motions passed on opposition days on the 12th of October and the 7th of December. On the uh, provisions of uh, new clause 3 concerning information sharing, the Secretary of State has been clear uh, since the very early days following the referendum that he will keep Parliament as least, uh, at least as well informed as the European Parliament as the negotiations progress. The amendment today asks us to reaffirm this position so that Parliament receives the same documents that the European Parliament or any of its committees receive from the Council or from the Commission. Now, the Government is absolutely resolute that this House will not be at an information disadvantage as compared with the European Parliament. But the amendment is actually flawed simply because the United Kingdom Government may not be privy to what information is passed confidentially uh, between the Commission or the other EU institutions and the Parliament itself, just as, of course, this House would not expect the Government to pass all our documents relating to a highly sensitive negotiation to the other side. Uh, what I can do, however, is to confirm that the Government will keep Parliament well informed, and as soon as we know how the EU institutions will share their information, we will give more information on what Parliament will receive and the mechanisms for it, uh, including the provision of arrangements for scrutiny of confidential documents. 
The second category of uh, amendments, which again I must resist because they uh, prejudge uh, the negotiations to follow, are amendment that, that, uh, amendments that ask for a formal reporting on a myriad of subjects or for votes on unilateral commitments. The exact structure of the negotiations has not yet been determined and may very well be a matter for negotiation itself. And therefore, setting an arbitrary reporting framework makes no sense at all. There will be times when there will be a great deal to report on and times when there is very little. The Prime Minister and the Secretary of State uh, have already made serious undertakings how they will report to this House. I give way. I'm grateful to the Minister because I know there were a lot of issues to be covered, but just to take the one example of the <coughs> European arrest warrant, yeah. could you at least give us an indication of what the Government's objectives are? are we, does he want us to stay uh, as part of it as we are at present? Well, clearly, clearly we require and we're looking to achieve a close cooperation with the European Union on security matters. But again, these will be a matter for negotiation. Uh, these will be a matter for negotiation, and as the negotiations progress, then we will uh, keep the House informed. Uh, and the commitments that the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State have given are important. That is why the Government published the White Paper on our negotiating position last week with an in introduction by the Prime Minister, once again stating our clear aims for the negotiations, uh, which includes, for example, uh, referred to by the Honourable Lady for Brighton Pav Pavilion, uh, implementation phases. Those are part of our objectives. No, I won't give way because I do have little time. The, um, the Secretary of State announced in the recent White Paper that there will be a further White Paper published on the Great Repeal Bill, so that Parliament can be kept fully informed of the provisions of the Bill in good time. And after that, the Government will continue upholding this commitment through the primary and secondary legislation that will undoubtedly be required. Amendments that ask for specific reporting to Parliament after invoking Article 50, including uh, new clauses 3, 20, 22, 29, 51, 111 to 130, and 151, for example, on our relationship with EU agencies on competition policy, environmental regulations, the UK renewable sector, and virtually every other aspect of our relationship with the EU are dangerous. They would bind us to an inflexible timetable of updates as we try to navigate a complex set of negotiations. I give it to the Talk to the Minister. I am following his speech carefully. Does he agree with me that it is a mistake to put the procedures of this House into primary legislation, which will give uh, the courts an unnecessary focus to interfere with our affairs? He makes, he makes an extremely important point. Uh, if these provisions are put on the face of the bill, then there is no doubt that they become justiciable, and that therefore would lead for, to further delay. What this country requires at the moment is certainty and speed, and instead we would have uncertainty and delay. In, I'll give, give way one last time to the Honourable Lady. Yeah. I'm grateful to him. Would he acknowledge that there is at least a possibility that a new trade agreement won't be agreed in a very tight two-year period? And if he does acknowledge that that is a risk, why won't he put in place a transitional arrangement <coughs> to protect our businesses from crashing out of the EU without any transition? Uh, I, I think that uh, I can go no further than what I have already said. Of course, transitional arrangements require bilateral agreement, and we have already indicated that that is what we are aiming at, but frankly, it takes, it takes two to tango in this regard. Uh, Amendment uh, 78 would require the Foreign Secretary to publish a work programme for UCREP for the duration of the negotiating period, and this is simply an attempt, frankly, to delay notification by creating new obligations and impediments for the Government. Uh, I turn now to uh, a matter which uh, exercised a large number of colleagues, uh, quite understandably, and I want to refer to uh, these amendments and new clauses in detail, and these relate to the status of EU citizens. Now, uh, providing certainty for this group of people is an important issue for the Government, and it is why the Prime Minister, in her speech, made it one of our 12 priority objectives for negotiations. I, I will not give way, I am afraid I have no, very little time. Uh, whilst these amendments call for different cut-off dates and vary in wording and terminology, they all share the same aim, 
to guarantee the status of EU nationals currently in the UK. Now, uh, Madam Chairman, the Government wholeheartedly agrees with this aim. As my uh, right hon. Friend the Prime Minister has said repeatedly, most recently this very afternoon, securing the status of EU nationals is one of the foremost, foremost priorities of this Government, and we have stood ready to reach an agreement from the beginning, because it is not in anyone's interest to allow any uncertainty over this issue to continue. Uh, I, I will not give way, because I have little time. As the uh, Prime Minister told the House earlier this afternoon, the Government recognises that European citizens who are resident of the UK make a vital contribution both to our economy and to our communities. And that uh, contribution was highlighted very personally by the contribution of my hon. Friend, the Member for South Leicestershire. We, without them, we would all be poorer, not least our important public services, such as the national health. This is – I will not give way any further – this is less an issue of principle than one of timing with a few EU countries insisting, frankly, that there can be no negotiation without notification and that, therefore, nothing can be settled until Article 50 is triggered. Now, we could not be clearer about our determination to resolve this issue at the earliest possible opportunity. Ensuring, the status of UK nationals in the, ensuring that the status of UK nationals in the EU is similarly protected. Now, some honourable members this afternoon have called for a unilateral guarantee now. But we have a very clear duty to UK citizens living in other member, EU member states, of whom there are about one million, to look after their interest and provide as much certainty of the, for their futures as well. The suggestion from some honourable members, effectively, that we should offer that unilateral guarantee to EU nationals in the UK, whilst at the same time failing to achieve security for our own nationals abroad, is a course that would carry the risk of a prolonged period of stressful uncertainty for them, which we are not prepared to accept. Therefore, it is only after we have passed this bill that my right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister, can trigger Article 50, and that I will not, I'll take no further interventions, I'm sorry, and therefore provide certainty not only to those EU nationals currently living within our own borders, but also to our nationals overseas. Uh, Madam Chairman, new clause 33 calls on the Prime Minister to set, to set out a draft framework, especially in regard to the new immigration system prior to notification. We have already set it out in our white paper that we'll, we will introduce an immigration bill. But I'd like to uh, reassure colleagues that Parliament will have a clear opportunity to debate and vote on this issue in the future. The Great Repeal Bill will not change our immigration system. This will be done through a separate immigration bill and subsequent secondary legislation, so nothing will change for any EU citizen, uh, whether already resident in the UK or moving from the UK without Parliament's approval. I give way. I'm extremely grateful to my right hon. Friend, who is doing a fantastic job in this position yeah, on behalf of yeah, the British people. Yeah. We are all concerned about our constituents, who are EU citizens, and who want certainty in this matter. But what I'm advising my constituents, who express concern to me, is they should write to their own governments, who are standing in the way of sorting out this problem. So, will my right honourable friend ensure that those foreign governments who are standing in the way of a settlement of this matter are left in no doubt that we find this objectionable? Yeah. Well, my uh, right honourable. I'll keep, if, 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 but bear with me. I, I, if my right honourable friend makes an important point. <laughs> this will be a, a matter for uh, negotiation in due course. But ultimately, we must all be conscious of the fact that we are dealing with human beings, we're dealing with families, we're dealing with people who are concerned about their futures, we're c they're concerned about their careers. And not only do we have a duty in this regard, but there is a duty right across the European Union for the interests of these individuals to be protected. Now, now, now I will in a moment. Now, I can, I, can tell the House, I can tell the House that I have discussed this issue on numerous occasions with my EU counterparts, and they assure me that they fully understand that this is an issue 
of simple humanity that must be put to the top of the agenda when the negotiations commence. But we must, we must wait until those negotiations commence, and, be, and, and until we do that, we must not make any concessions. I give way to the Honourable Lady. Thank you. Thank the Minister for finally giving way. I want to talk about my constituent from Germany, Mr Jörg Neuter. He came to see me on Friday and he's lived in Scotland for almost four years. He's understandably concerned about his future and the uncertainty surrounding his residency. Now, there's nothing preventing the government from providing that certainty to him yeah, yeah. and millions tonight. So will the minister now provide that? Will he do that yeah, now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we owe the primary responsibility to our citizens in EU countries, but we also owe a duty. We also owe a duty to EU nationals in this country to ensure that their interests are. But frankly, this is also a matter for their governments too. Ma Madam Chairman. Ma Madam Chairman, uh, I, I, the, this has been an interesting debate, it has been a lengthy debate, an important debate, uh, but I must resist all the amendments. Yeah. Matthew Pennycook. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I will be very brief. Uh, I am pleased that the Minister recognised the thoughtfulness of new Clause 3 and other new clauses and amendments, uh, and I note his intention to keep the House well informed, but it is deeply disappointing that the Minister has resisted new Clause 3, and so we will be seeking to test the will of the House on this matter. The question is that new Clause 3 be read a second time. As many as I have that opinion say aye. Aye. On the contrary, no. No. A second time. As many as I have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. no. Tell us for the ayes, Thangham Debonair and Jeff Smith. Tell us for the noes, Graham Stewart and Mark Spencer. Thank you.